hello there and welcome to the Firebase Summit. I'm so glad you could join me today because this is our fifth annual Firebase Summit and it's the first one where you can't meet in person. But I still remember meeting so many of you in Berlin in 2016 and then we went to Amsterdam, to Prague and last year it was an even bigger group of us all together in Madrid. Well, this year we're all meeting in my living room here or maybe in your living room or your home office or wherever you are tuning in from. Thank you for joining us. It's really great to see you. And while we miss seeing many of you in person, we're really excited that we get to welcome even more of you in this virtual format. You know what's also new this year? This is the first year that the Firebase Summit is two days. So we get to hang out together today and tomorrow. And remember, while we're interacting here today and tomorrow, let's take care to be excellent to each other. Right? So when you meet someone new, introduce yourselves. And let's practice our yes and mindset. Because it doesn't matter whether you use tabs or if you use spaces. It doesn't even matter if you say GIFs or if you say GIF. We're all better together. And with that, we're ready to kick us off. And what better way to kick off than with a keynote full of feature updates, new releases and product demos. And you know what would be really extra fun for me? I'm going to be watching it from my couch here and join on the live chat. So you should find the live chat around here. And I'd really love it if you join me so we can talk about what we see going on in there. Then after the keynote is over, let's all meet back here so we can go over the program for the rest of the summit. Is that a deal? Great. So now let's all sit back, relax, and enjoy this year's Firebase Summit. Hello everyone, I'm Francis Ma and I lead product development for Firebase. I'm delighted to welcome you to our fifth annual Firebase Summit. Every year, we look forward to bringing our community of developers together to share what we've been up to and to see what you've been building with our tools. But before we jump into that, I want to first talk about how this unprecedented year has shaped our work. We've always believed that apps have drastically improved the way we live. But over the past few months, we've seen that apps also enhance our ability to adapt to change. The events of 2020 have brought both changes and challenges for all of us. During this time, more businesses, institutions, and families have turned to apps to stay connected, productive, and entertained. At the same time, we've seen developers like you step up with strength, resilience, and ingenuity to build and scale apps people are relying on. Our team, alongside the rest of Google, has strived to be helpful and supportive in this moment. Our mission is to help developers succeed by making it easy to build and operate mobile and web apps. We bring together Google products and cloud services across the lifecycle of your app under one platform. Through Firebase, you can quickly spin up your app backend without managing infrastructure, release your app with confidence with app monitoring, and boost engagement with rich analytics and experimentation capabilities. People are relying on your apps. You can rely on us to keep your app and business up and running. Last year, we shared that 2 million apps actively use Firebase every month. This year, that number continues to grow to over 2.5 million monthly active apps, which includes global businesses like Gameloft, Hotstar, Le Figaro, and innovative startups like Classkick. Now, I want to zoom in on Classkick because they're one example from our incredible community of how apps are helping people adapt to new surroundings. Classkick is a full spectrum learning platform that teachers can use to digitize their classrooms, monitor their students' work, and most importantly, give real-time feedback. Classkick also gives students the freedom to work at their own pace and receive help when they get stuck. To build this near instantaneous communication between teachers and students, the Classkick team turned to Firebase and Google. Their backend is powered by our real-time database and supported by Google Cloud monitoring and logging. When the COVID-19 pandemic forced schools to close, Classkick onboarded thousands of new teachers and school administrators to their platform. With a little re-architecting on their end and some assistance from Firebase, they were able to scale exponentially to meet this new demand so students can continue to learn effectively from home and stay engaged with their teachers and classmates. Now, as a parent myself, 
who's also juggling between work and helping my kids with remote learning. It's stories like these that inspire us to keep making Firebase better. This year, we've been focused on three things. First, helping you accelerate your app development with building blocks that solve many common and core problems involved with building your app. Second, helping you run your app more effectively by simplifying your workflows and surfacing actionable insights so you can optimize your app experience. And third, helping you tailor Firebase to your needs by making the platform more extensible and giving you more control and flexibility as you scale. Today, we've got exciting announcements to share across all three of these areas. So let's dive in, starting with how Firebase accelerates app development. As we've all realized, speed, agility, and productivity are even more important in today's environment because we're working across a distributed team, facing distractions at home, and seeing shifts in customer demands and behavior. To help you stay focused on building amazing app experiences, Firebase provides fully managed backend services, from databases that sync and store data in real time, to cloud functions that help you run code in the cloud, to Firebase ML that makes it easy to add the power of machine learning into your app. With these services, you can quickly set up your entire infrastructure, create efficient workflows, and add new features and functionality to your app in fewer steps. Last year, we launched Firebase Emulator Suite to let you run emulated versions of our backend products for a faster and safer developer experience. This suite runs locally on your own machine enabling rapid iterations without touching production data or incurring costs. The emulator suite even comes with its own UI, which gives you a nice visual console for your local environment. It even has extra features to make development easier and testing easier. To tell you what's new in our emulator suite, I'm going to turn it over to David. The emulator suite already supports hosting, real-time database, Firestore, Cloud Functions, and Cloud PubSub, but we have added a new product to that list, Firebase Authentication. So now you have your own local development environment for managing test users and running integration tests that rely on authentication, and it's really easy to add it to your current development workflow. After a quick setup, you can boot the entire emulator suite up with a single command. Firebase emulators start. Your local development suite can now consist of hosting, real-time database, Firestore, functions, PubSub, and now authentication. You can view each one with the emulator. The emulator UI now has a new authentication tab for user management. You have all the options you need when creating new users, like display name, email, password, photo URL, phone number, and even custom claims, which is really helpful in role-based systems. Connecting your app to the auth emulator is easy with the connector API. The connector API points your app to the local auth emulator port. After this API call, there is nothing you need to change about your existing Firebase authentication code. It works the same with the emulator as it does in production. One of the great features of Firebase authentication are its cloud function triggers. This authentication trigger fires whenever a new user is created and checks for project invitations sent by other users in Firestore. So when a new user signs up, they are automatically added to the projects they need. Authentication triggers run locally, which gives you low latency responses, instant code reload, and really a much better development experience overall. The new emulator suite with Firebase Authentication is available today. Check out our Getting Started Guide to add it to your project. Thanks, David. As you just saw, the emulator suite, which now includes support for Firebase Auth, lets you shift to a local-first developer workflow so you can experiment and rapidly iterate without worrying that you'll break something. Since launch, we've heard from so many developers just how much they love the emulator suite because it allows them to develop their code so much faster. Speaking of fast development, I want to highlight another backend product that can save you both time and hassle, Firebase hosting. Firebase hosting helps you easily deploy secure, fast-loading web apps and landing pages that are backed by a global CDN. 
Just last month, we've added new features that many of you have been asking for, like an integration with cloud logging that gives you more server-side analytics, support for broadly compression to boost your site performance, and improved support for localized content. But that's not all. Today, we're happy to announce the launch of Preview Channels. Preview Channels lets you see your changes before publishing them to your site. With a single command, you can deploy changes to a preview channel in seconds and share that unique channel URL with your team. To learn more about this feature and see a demo, check out our dedicated session called Shipping Production Web Apps with Hosting. All right, so far, we've talked about how the Firebase Emulator Suite and Firebase Hosting can accelerate your app development by making iteration and collaboration easier, quicker, and safer across teams. The other way that Firebase speeds up development is through Firebase extensions, which are pre-packaged solutions that automate common development tasks and let you add new functionality in fewer steps. At last year's Firebase Summit, we introduced you to nine extensions to make your life easier. Whether you want to resize an image, add people to an email list, or shorten URLs, we have an extension that you can plug into your project and get going. And we've added some new extensions since then. Let's go to Todd for an update here. Thanks, Francis. So the first new extension I want to highlight is Detect Online Presence, which lets you see what users or devices are currently online when they connect using Cloud Firestore. This can be really useful if you're a game developer or building a social app and want to let your users know when their friends are online. But what's even more exciting is we've started partnering with developers like Stripe to build new extensions using our combined expertise. The first one, Send Invoices with Stripe, will let you automatically send branded customer invoices when an order is added to a particular collection inside your Cloud Firestore database. But I want to give you a closer look at the second extension the Stripe team has built with us, Run Subscription Payments with Stripe. Now, subscriptions can be a great way for developers to earn money. You can give users upgraded features or bonus material when they subscribe. And while mobile developers have had various app stores to help them with managing these payments, web developers can use services like Stripe to manage most of the work around processing payments, providing trial periods, handling cancellations and prorated refunds, and much more. And while all that is definitely helpful, there's still the work involved in having your web application communicate back and forth with Stripe. Your app needs to know what subscription options are available. Stripe needs to know what product your customer is purchasing. And most importantly, your application needs to know if your user is currently a subscriber. Now, this is where the subscription payments extension comes in really handy. It handles the majority of the work in making sure Firebase and Stripe can communicate with each other so you can handle subscription payments with little effort. Let's see how it works. All right, so here I have my exciting new blog, Todd's Tech Tips. And while I have given away a lot of my content for free, I've decided to make some of my posts, like this one here, available only for subscribers. Now, on the back end, these posts are being stored right here in Cloud Firestore. I've got my normal posts here and my premium posts in a separate collection. So I basically have the foundation set up to provide a premium service. Now I just need to do the work to make that happen. So the first thing I'll do is install the Run Subscription Payments extension. This basically involves telling the extension a little bit about my database, like where I'm storing my customer info, where I want to store documents about my premium products, setting up a webhook for Stripe to talk to, and adding a few API keys. Now that that's done, you'll see that when I add new products, like my premium membership here in Stripe, those will get added automatically to my Cloud Firestore database. The cloud function created by this extension is doing the work of keeping all of my products in sync. And so right here is my premium membership, and my pricing options are listed here in this subcollection. So now inside my web app, if I need to show my premium subscription pricing options to my user, I can query this collection. I'll grab the pricing documents, and then I'll display these values on the page. And so now when I reload my page, it looks like this with my pricing information here at the bottom. And that's certainly helpful, but what's even more exciting is now I can add the ability to upgrade our user to a premium subscriber in about 20 lines of code. Let me show you how. So the first thing I need to do is create a new document in a checkout sessions collection where I add the ID of the specific subscription plan my user is interested in, along with a few redirect URLs. Now, what you'll see on the back end is that as soon as that document gets added, and honestly, it happens too fast for me to really capture here, a cloud function created by this extension communicates with Stripe to create a session ID and then adds that session ID into this document. 
So back in my client, I can watch this document for changes. And when it gets updated with the session ID, I can take that information and use the Stripe JavaScript library to redirect our users to Stripe, where they can go ahead and complete the payment process. No copying down my credit card number now. When that whole process is complete, Stripe redirects the user back to my website. But on the back end, the Stripe extension has performed two important bits of work for me. First, it's added this subscription subcollection directly to my user document, so I have an official record of what subscriptions my user is a part of, which I can query at any point. But also, it's added in a custom auth claim to my user's Firebase auth token. Here, uh, I'll show it to you here in my Chrome console. It's this Stripe role claim here. Now, this provides a convenient way to look up our user's membership status through the auth library in the JavaScript client, which means that on the client, I can now implement this get premium member status method like so. But of course, we know we can't entirely trust clients, and that's OK. This custom claim is signed by Firebase, which means we can use Firebase security rules to verify that this information is correct server side as well. So by adding a line like this, here are my security rules, I can make sure that only premium members can see my awesome new content. And this means that if I reload our page, I finally get to see my premium content. And uh, look at that. That's, uh, that's anticlimactic. Well, it just so happens that the Stripe extension also makes it easy for me to send users to the Stripe customer portal so they can adjust or cancel their membership as well. So uh, yeah, I, I think we'll just do that. Now, there's a lot more that this extension can do for you, like handling taxes, everybody's favorite topic, accepting coupon codes, handling when users delete their account, and much more. You can check out the documentation to get started. And just like all of our extensions, all the code is freely available on GitHub, so you can see how these things work, file pull requests, or even make your own versions of these cloud functions. It's completely up to you. And of course, none of this would have been possible without the really smart folks at Stripe who wrote a lot of this code. So thank you, Stripe engineers. And back to you, Francis. Thanks, Todd. Since the early days of Firebase, we've strived to offer fully managed backend infrastructure that speeds up your time to market. With the emulator suite, you can develop, prototype, and test your code instantly in a safe local environment. Firebase hosting's new preview channels let you check that your changes are working as intended right away. And with our new extensions, you can easily add new features and functionality to your app without having to research or learn new APIs or code. It's all done for you. Over the coming year, we'll continue to invest in tools and building blocks that accelerate your app development so you can deliver value to your users in less time. Now, let's shift gears and talk about how Firebase can help you run your app more efficiently. Once you're ready to ship, you can use products like Test Lab, App Distribution, Performance Monitoring, and Crashlytics to release your app with confidence and improve its quality. We also offer products like Remote Config, Cloud Messaging, and A-B Testing to help you increase user engagement. Our main goal is to surface actionable insights from your app data and simplify your workflows so you can optimize your app and ultimately keep users happy. Anytime you release a new version of your app, some of the first data points you'll want to pay attention to are the stability and performance metrics. After all, you want to make a good first impression with new users so they stick around and leave positive App Store reviews that boost your ranking. These days, nobody has the time or patience to wait for slow apps. Firebase Performance Monitoring gathers and presents data about your app's performance so you know exactly what's happening in your app when users are experiencing slowness from their point of view. But sometimes, there's so much information, it's hard to focus on what's important. To share how we're solving this problem of information overload, I'll turn it over to Melissa. Thanks, Francis. We're excited to announce that we've redesigned the performance monitoring dashboard to help you focus on what matters most. The new performance monitoring dashboard makes it crystal clear if one of your critical metrics needs your attention so that you can take action as needed. Let's take a look at the new dashboard in action. The dashboard is customizable, allowing you to add the metrics that are critical to your business. For mobile apps, app start time is included on the dashboard out of the box, and you can have up to six metrics that can be swapped in or out at any time. Let's say that we're working on a news app called Friendly News, and recently we've gotten some feedback from users that the curated stories page is feeling slower than it did last week. 
We want to monitor metrics that could be related to this feedback front and center, so we'll start by adding slow rendering frames for the screen that users have been reporting issues about. We can do that by clicking here to select a metric. We'll select screen rendering traces for the trace type, the curated stories activity trace, click slow rendering, then select the metric. Now we can easily spot that this screen is in fact rendering slower than it did last week, which aligns with what users were telling us. But in particular, we can see that it's actually a lot slower for the latest version of our app than our baseline. Let's say that we want to see how previous versions performed to get a better feel for whether the issue is only impacting the latest version. We can do that by selecting another version, the version picker. It looks like this increase is really only visible in the latest version, so we'll want to have our team dig deeper into this part of the code, since maybe this points to an issue with some new animations that were added to the screen recently, or some other changes. Our team also recently added a custom trace to measure how long it takes to load a user's curated stories list, so we'll add that here too. And it looks like this metric isn't performing too well either, so we'll want to learn more about the impact of the issue. One way we can do this is by filtering down to a particular percentile to see how the slowest 75% or a different subset of users is viewing our app. It looks like at the 75th percentile, things are loading almost twice as slow as for our median, and the upward trend is even more severe. With some problems identified, our friendly news development team can get to work on fixes, and we'll be able to refer back here to help validate improvements. To help do this, we can narrow the dashboard to only show data since my latest version was released, since this is when my metrics started to spike, until the metrics on the dashboard trend green and look like this. And we know how important it is to detect and fix issues like these as soon as possible and prevent them from impacting your users. To that end, we've built a new, much faster processing pipeline so that coming soon, all metrics will be reported in under a few minutes' time. Back to you, Francis. Thanks, Melissa. The new performance monitoring dashboard takes mountains of performance data about your app, organizes it, and surfaces critical insights so you can focus on what's most important and take action to improve your app experience. Another way you can optimize your app is with Firebase Remote Config. Remote Config lets you dynamically alter your app, safely test and release new features, and stay in control of the whole experience without having to publish a new version. But as your project grows bigger and gets more complex, it might become harder to manage and navigate through all of your parameters. So over the past few months, we've added new features to help. To tell you more about them, here's Steve. Thanks, Francis. We've made a bunch of improvements to Remote Config to help you organize and visualize your app configuration so you can focus on the parameters that you care about the most. First is the ability to group parameters that are related into their own folder. For example, in this project, I've got a few parameters that I'm using to configure the fall theme for my app. I'll select those and click Move to Group. I'll call it Fall Theme and add a description so my team can tell what these are being used for. I'll save it, and now you can see those parameters are neatly tucked away in this folder together. Next up is parameter sorting and filtering. As the number of features in your app increases, the number of parameters you might be looking to control with Remote Config will grow as well. To help you manage this growing list, you can now sort your parameters alphabetically by parameter name, and we've improved the search functionality so you can quickly jump to the parameter you're looking for. As your remote config implementation gets even more sophisticated and you add more conditions to these values, it might be hard to see which values are applied to specific audiences. Which of these values, for instance, are applicable to the new feature that I'm rolling out in my app? To help you with that, we've added this filtering functionality so you can restrict your view to only parameters that affect a specific app or platform or a particular condition. You probably noticed the experiment icon that shows up for some parameters. We've brought experiment status right into the remote config dashboard, so you no longer have to switch over to A-B testing to see which parameters are part of an experiment. And you can click on the experiment icon to jump right into the experiment results page. That's it for dashboard improvements. On to some targeting improvements. Targeting by app version is a great way to ensure that only users with a specific app experience are affected. Previously, Remote Config only supported version targeting on Android, but now it's available on iOS too. You can now also use numeric comparators when defining your version condition. And Remote Config is smart enough to understand semantic versioning, so we know that version 10.0 is later than version 9.12. No more writing complicated regular expressions to match your app versions. 
targeting all the users that have access to your new feature, just set the condition to greater than or equal to your latest app version. I'd also like to give you a sneak peek of something that will be rolling out shortly. We've heard from you that you'd like to get more visibility into how your remote config is behaving for your customers. So we've added a couple of handy monitoring tools. We've added this graph here at the top of the page, which will give you a real time view into your customers fetching from remote config. So when you publish a new version of your template, you can see it rolling out and know exactly how many of your users have received it so far. Also, if you scroll down here to the parameter table, you'll see we added a fetch percentage column. This tells you how your conditions are evaluating for this parameter. So you can see the distribution of values that are reaching your customers. This is a great way to get confidence that your config is functioning how you expect and to understand the attributes of your user base. And those are our updates for remote config. Over to you, Francis. Thanks, Steve. The organizational and targeting improvements we made to remote config will help you manage and control your app experiences as you grow. Now, in addition to organization, automation is also necessary to run your app efficiently and get it ready to scale. For example, when your app crashes, you want to know as soon as possible so you can mobilize your team and resolve the issue before it becomes a big problem and impacts a lot of users. Firebase Crashlytics can help you monitor, prioritize, and fix stability issues. But how can you stay on top of stability when you're away from your desk? That's where automation comes in. To tell you more, let's go to Ibrahim. Thanks, Francis. Crashlytics is a great tool to measure your app stability, find out where your users are encountering problems, and really dig into the technical details around each crash to make it easier for you to deliver a stable app to all of your customers. And through the Firebase dashboard, you can access a lot of this information, from high-level overviews of your app stability to detailed stack traces for individual crashes. Of course, you probably don't want to spend every waking hour reloading your dashboard to see if there has been a sudden increase in your app's instability. So, Crashetics can send automated crash alerts to your team, whether that's through email, Jira, Slack, or PagerDuty. And if you ever want more information on your app's crashes, or want to view custom reports that aren't available in the Firebase console, we have given that power by letting you export your data to BigQuery for better logging, analysis, and troubleshooting. And while that's been really helpful, some of you want even more fine-tuned control over your alerts. Maybe you care about specific crashes on a particular device, or on the newest operating system, or in a particular part of the world. Well, just recently, we added the ability to stream in Crashitix data into BigQuery in near real time. So, you can act on that crash data faster than ever before, whether it is to power custom alerts or to create up-to-date customized dashboards. Here, let me show you how. This here is my lovely sample app, FriendlyPix. This is a fun picture sharing app that is available to download from the App Store. And I have got it running with the latest Crashitix SDK, so I can see how stable my latest release is. Like any Crashitix powered app, I am also signed up to receive alerts when there is a regression in a previously closed issue, or there is a sudden increase in a specific type of crash. And that is great, but now that iOS 14 is out, I am particularly concerned about whether there are any crashes that are happening on this latest operating system. And I wanted to be alerted as soon as new crashes are seen. Well, this is easy to do now that I am streaming my Crashitix data into BigQuery. Here, you can see my data in BigQuery. It is being added in near real time, usually within a few seconds of a crash being reported to Crashitix. And of course, I can go ahead and run custom queries against my data right here in the BigQuery dashboard. But I can also run queries against them in any environment 
that can access BigQuery, like, for instance, a Google Cloud function. I can schedule a query and trigger my Cloud function with pops up when the result is ready. Or I can schedule a Cloud function that runs the actual query itself. Here, you can see that I have a Cloud function running on a regular interval that queries all of my Crashitix data. So, I can look for all the crashes that occurred in the last hour, specifically on iOS 14. And if the number of crashes reaches a certain threshold, I can perform whatever action seems most appropriate. I can file a bug in our internal bug tracking tool, or send an email to my development team, or as in my case, I can ping my team's iOS developer Slack channel. Here's my Slack message with a link here to Data Studio, where I have created a customized report showing me just crashes related to iOS 14. But really, this could be any custom report you want to create based off your BigQuery data. And you are free to use any data visualization tool that talks to BigQuery, whether that is Data Studio, Tableau, Looker, or more. And again, because this BigQuery data is being streamed by Crashitix to BigQuery in near real time, I know I am seeing the most up-to-date version of my data. Thanks to these time alerts and customized reports, I can release new versions of my app with confidence, knowing that if there is a problem with my app stability, I can get in there and fix it before my customers notice. Back to you, Francis. Thanks, Ibrahim. Crashlytics BigQuery Streaming enables you to automate a lot of the work needed for release monitoring, so your team can stay on top of stability no matter where they are. This has been a highly requested feature, especially from our advanced enterprise customers, because it allows them to configure their alerting system to suit their needs. All right, so we just saw demos of our new features in performance monitoring, remote config, and Crashlytics. The underlying goal with all of these updates is to help you run your app more effectively by servicing actionable insights and simplifying and automating your workflows. With Firebase, we want to make it easy for you to operate your app and get you ready to scale. Now, we recognize that as your app and business grow, your development challenges may become more complex. So in addition to adding more automation capabilities, like the one you just saw with Crashlytics, we're also working to give you more control and flexibility so you can tailor our products to suit your sophisticated needs. One of the key factors in scaling a successful app is in knowing how your users are interacting with it. And thanks to our robust integration with Google Analytics, we can shed some light. Google Analytics helps you understand what actions users are taking inside your app, where they're spending their time, and why they churn, so you can make smarter decisions about your app's direction. We have some exciting updates on this front, so I'm going to pass it over to Kevin for more. Hey, thanks, Francis. Now, around this time last year, we announced a significant new upgrade in Google Analytics that allows you to measure your product's behavior across both native apps and your web-powered ones. This gives you a single view of customer engagement across platforms and devices for greater insight. But today, we're excited to announce three new APIs that make it easier for you to collect, record, and manage your data. Now let's take a look at the very first one, the Analytics Measurement Protocol. Measurement Protocol is an API that lets you log events to Google Analytics directly allowing you to augment your client-side data. Now, this can be useful in many different situations, from measuring IoT devices to point-of-sale systems. But one of the most common use cases is for developers to make direct server-to-server -server calls, like measuring offline purchases for an e-commerce business. Now, let me give you a quick demonstration of how this works. For many e-commerce applications, one important step in the process of completing a payment is to validate a user's credit card and to make sure it's not fraudulent. Obviously, for security reasons, this is not code we want to be running client-side. And moreover, 
there may be information we want to pass to analytics without potentially exposing it to a client. Now let's see what that kind of setup could look like. In our app, we've got a standard purchase event with all the event parameters set for logging. Before we commit the purchase though, we want to first validate the payment method. So we'll be using a Google Cloud function. It's worth noting that if you prefer, you could easily set up this call in any other server-side environment as well. Depending on the outcome of this call, you might want to log an event or two with analytics to see what kind of fraud rate you're receiving, or if this step is causing too many purchasers to drop out of your funnel. If you wanted to, you could actually wait for the call to complete, and after checking the status of it, log an event on the client in case fraud was detected. But in this case, we actually have some information like the provider we used and the reason the payment was denied. We also have complex and proprietary application code that we want to remain server-side. With measurement protocol, I can accomplish that just by adding a few lines here. And our server-side function will fire off this analytics call directly. Now, in fact, if I head over to the Google Analytics console, I can see it right here in the real-time panel. And after just a few hours, they'll start showing up in our usual event reports here in Google Analytics and in the Firebase dashboard. In addition to the measurement protocol API, we've added two more that you might find useful. First, the data API provides you with the tools you need to programmatically access your Google Analytics reporting data, and it was built for those of you who want to make your own custom dashboards or view data from multiple projects at once. And the admin API gives you the ability to programmatically manage your analytics configuration and user access rights. For example, you can add user permissions or link Firebase projects to Google Analytics all through your own custom tools. And together, these APIs give you the tools to quickly and dynamically adapt your information architecture to your growing business so that you can spend less time tinkering in the console and more time building in an app that delights your users. To try out all of these features, head on over to the Google Analytics measurement site today. And if you haven't done so already, start your upgrade to the new Google Analytics 4 experience. Now back to you, Francis. Thanks, Kevin. We know that data is the backbone of all successful businesses. With these updates to Google Analytics, we're giving you more control so you can record, collect, and manage your data in a way that suits your needs. But that's not all. Over the years, we've seen many of you take advantage of our BigQuery integration by exporting data from Firebase, joining it with data from other channels, and running sophisticated analysis, and even creating your own custom user segments in BigQuery. Now, we're giving you the power to bring these custom segments back from BigQuery into Firebase for targeting. Today, I'm thrilled to announce the launch of Imported Segments. With Imported Segments, you can target any custom user segments with products like Remote Config, Cloud Messaging, and In-App Messaging. So for example, let's say you're a game developer who has created a custom ML model that identifies your top performers. Now, you can send a message targeted to these top performers with Cloud Messaging. Or let's say you're an e-commerce app and have a physical storefront. Now you can import users that come from offline sources, like your store, and send them in-app promotion with Firebase in-app messaging. This feature is available through our Firebase BigQuery integration. All you have to do is create your own custom segment and import it into your BigQuery dataset. Then Firebase will be able to read that data and make those segments available for targeting. We built imported segments to give you more control and flexibility to target your users. We know scaling can come with some growing pains, but with this launch and the update to Google Analytics, we're making it easier to tailor Firebase to support your sophisticated needs. All right, we've spent the last 30 minutes talking a lot about how the new work we've done to make Firebase better. As you just saw, we've been focused on giving you building blocks that accelerate app development so you can solve many common and core problems in developing an app, helping you run your app more effectively by simplifying your workflows and servicing insights when you need it so you can increase app quality and user engagement, and helping you tailor Firebase to your needs by making our platform more extensible and giving you more control and flexibility as you scale. With every improvement to Firebase, we aim to make app development easier 
so you can stay focused on building the amazing app experiences that people need to stay productive, connected, and entertained, especially during these strange times. People are relying on your apps to adapt and thrive in our changing world. You can rely on us to build, operate, and scale successful apps. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of the day. And here is Derek to give you a preview of what's happening throughout the rest of Firebase Summit. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us at the 2020 Firebase Summit in our special virtual format this year. As you heard in the keynote, Firebase is your partner throughout the life cycle of your app. From the moment an app idea pops into your head, right up until you, fingers crossed, face the desirable challenge of needing to scale to millions of users. These days, people are relying on your apps more than ever, and you can rely on us to keep your app and your business up and running. That's why it's so important for us to be able to engage with all of you during our annual event. We have a lot planned, including sharing all the latest Firebase updates and best practices, as well as learning resources, and of course, hearing your feedback. Let's cover the schedule for the Firebase Summit over the next two days. First, Right after this video, we'll be hosting our live Ask Firebase session, where Tally Sazon and David East will be responding to your questions live on air. We'll be looking for questions in the chat, so please post them, and we might answer them right on the show. After that, we'll start our technical sessions, covering everything from best practices for security and authentication to getting your web app ready for production using Firebase hosting. To make it even more exciting, through the magic of technology, the Firebase speakers will also be watching the video with you. So please engage with us and ask questions directly in the live chat. We'll be replying back to you as we watch together. The full list and schedule of sessions is available on the Firebase Summit website at firebase.google.com summit. And don't worry, if you miss any of the live sessions, you'll be able to access them on the site or on YouTube within the next couple of days. On day two, starting at 9.30 a.m. US Pacific time, we'll open up with a live stream of our world-famous Zero to App session, where our very own Puff will live code an app using Firebase and Flutter from start to finish. You'll also be able to interact live with the app being built, and of course, with the Firebasers watching with you. After that, we'll have our second stream of technical sessions as we close out the Firebase Summit for this year. But we have a lot more content for you to continue engaging with us and learning more about using the latest Firebase features. First, check out our new demos that showcase how to use Firebase in lots of fun and helpful ways. For example, check out the Improve Your App demo to see a few practical use cases you can implement easily using a few Firebase features. Just click on the improvement you want to apply, and you'll be guided through an interactive video flow showing you how to implement the use cases you've selected. Next. We have a lot of great new code lab content to provide you with hands-on learning using Firebase for your favorite platform. For example, learn how to build and test a web app completely locally and offline using the Firebase emulator suite, or learn how you can use Firebase and Flutter together to build your next great mobile app. We even have a new code lab for game developers that shows you how to integrate the C++ SDK into your cross-platform games. All of these code labs are available at the Firebase Summit website and you can start learning any of them within a few clicks. And finally, we've brought back our dear Firebase postcard Dropbox, but this time in a virtual web app format. Take a few minutes to send us a note. We're looking forward to hearing from you. All right, with that, let's get started with our technical sessions. Thanks again for joining us. And wherever you're tuning in from, we hope you have a great Firebase Summit. Well, hello, everyone. What a keynote that was. And we're going to recap it all today with hashtag AskFirebaseLive. Now, that was a lot of stuff. We had the off emulator, import segments, crash lytics, uh, streaming to BigQuery. My, my mind's just like going crazy with all the stuff that, you know, was talked about there. All the stuff with remote config. It's, it, you know, there was a lot. And we're going to cover it all today in this live episode of hashtag AskFirebase. But I'm just one person, uh, David East, by the way, I don't think I mentioned my name, but I'm one person and I need somebody else to help me. So if you would all please give a warm welcome to Tali Sasson. Hi, everybody. Wasn't that keynote awesome? I loved it. I, me too. Okay, I was a big fan. 
So Tally, I know who you are, and I'm very excited to have you as my co-host today. But I would like if you could tell the audience a little bit about yourself, the, the Tally backstory. Sure, sure. Yeah, I can. I am an engineering leader in Firebase, and I get to work with a lot of the awesome teams that build some of those products that you saw mentioned in the keynote. Products like Firebase Performance, Crashlytics, Remote Config, and a bunch more. So I'm really excited to answer your questions today. And we do we have quite a lot of questions, but I, I yeah. always like, I like to open these with uh, what I call the icebreaker. Okay. And so just kind of get things going. So uh, between the two of us, I'm going to ask you what your favorite part of the keynote was. Oh, okay. Well, that that's a great question. I think I have two answers. Can I do two answers? Uh, I don't know if that breaks the rule. You know quick, what? That's fine. You're, that's fine. Okay, I'll, okay. You can have to. Okay. Okay, good, good. Um, well, you know what? I really loved seeing the new Firebase performance dashboard. You know, there's some mm, amazing improvements there. And I just love the fact that it allows users to really customize to ensure their most important performance metrics are visible and available. So I liked that. And, and then I also, good. yeah, it looks so good. Yeah, <laughs> I was excited about it. Um, and then I also think, you know, maybe folks spotted Ibrahim had a pretty amazing sunset in the background. I just thought that that was that was like a side a side benefit of that keynote it was like oof that is a nice backdrop there it's like a good setting so those were See, my I, two I shouldn't let you have two because that was my one it was Ibrahim oh, sunset no. so you just swept oh, no. right in there and took what is this my, gonna mean uh, oh no oh man oh, do you have a backup. Yeah. I, I mean, it's easy to have a backup, but yeah, Ibrahim Sunset. I, I remember watching that one before Amazing. and I, I, I had to drop the whole message into the Firebase chat. And I was like, Dis, has people seen like the, like Ibrahim Sunset? I was just like, whoa, yeah. that, that just blew my mind. So yeah. uh, my favorite thing, I that's tough. It's hard to pick a favorite, but I would say my favorite part was probably the auth emulator, not just because I got to, you know, do the little part there, but just because I have been wanting that feature for so yeah. long, uh, it's it's close though. Like you know, Crashlytics stream. There, there's so much. So yeah, it was exciting. So I, I think we have some questions now. I'm really excited. Okay. There were so many that came in. So uh, let's uh, let's load up the first question. Get into so, it. Let's see here. Let me get up to my sheet. Uh, so the first question is from Ellison. Elson asks, can I import users to the auth emulator when it boots up? Well, thank you for your question, Ellison. That's that's a very good question. So I, I think I can take this one, or do you want to take Tally? Yeah, go take... for it. OK, all right. So uh, right now, the auth emulator, it's brand new. Very excited about it. We don't have any command line flags or UI in it just yet to do uh, bulk importing and exporting of users. Uh, but that is on our roadmap, and we really want to add that in. Uh, in the meantime, there are uh, local REST endpoints, because the emulator runs on your local machine, where you can run, you kind of send some post requests and uh, seed your users after it boots up. And uh, you can also do some uh, scripting, depending on what kind of login flow you're doing. Uh, so you can do that. And one nice little thing, if right. you're doing testing with the, I uh, just sort of, sorry, local development with the auth emulator is when you create a user with like third party. So uh, like, so, you know, with Google sign in, you can create that user, click a button to generate all of the UI that pops up uh, for that user. And then their profile sticks around in that session. So it's, uh, it kind of retains cool. all the users you've created. So it's, it makes development so much easier and, uh, I've been using it, and I, I, I've just been so excited about it. So I, you should all really try it. If, you have, if you're still testing on Firebase projects, like a test Firebase project, and you're not on the emulator yet, now could not be the, a better time for you to make that switch to the Firebase emulator, because it's awesome. So, Yeah, I totally agree. That, that's definitely exciting to be able to solve those problems for folks. Yes. And so our next question is ready. So our next question comes from Kevin. And Kevin asks, is there some way I can see my performance data from Firebase Performance for a specific crash in Crashlytics? Now, I think this is one, Tally, that you know just a, just a lot about, actually. So I'm going to let yeah, you Yeah, I'd love to this answer one. this one. Thank you so much for the question, Kevin. So, you know, I think that there's a, 
a couple different answers here. The first one is that both Firebase performance and Crashlytics data can be exported to BigQuery. And that's definitely the easiest way that you can join these two data sets to be able to really dig into specific performance trends for different crashes. So that's one awesome approach to use. The other thing I just wanted to mention real quick is, as you heard in the keynote, we are hard at work making Firebase performance more real time. And that is going to be really useful because you'll be able to match the data in performance monitoring with the real time data that you already see in Crashlytics. So I think that it'll make it a lot easier to be able to dig into performance for specific crashes. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So um, let me see here. Uh, so, more questions, uh, more questions? I think, yeah, I think we should do another question. So our next question is from Crystal. And Crystal asks, how's the pricing on BigQuery for streaming mm -hmm. and querying this data? So with uh, Crashlytics streaming, you uh, get all the benefits of the uh, free tier within BigQuery, which is pretty big. I. I I know I had to go there, but um, sh but uh, so the the big query free tier, I think you get. I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me because I, I think closed it's 10, it 10 gigabytes yeah. of storage, yes. right? Yeah, and then one terabyte of queries. Yes, I believe so. And you get ten gigabytes of your create model queries, which is more once you know you, you don't need to know exactly what it is before you get involved with BigQuery, but it's also a large amount of of free tier usage. Sure. So. Uh, the more finer grain points uh, are available on Cloud's uh, pricing documentation, which you totally check out. It's a very, very good site. Uh, but you can get started uh, and do a lot. And all the all those free tier numbers are monthly, per month, too. So there's a lot that you can go through in a month before you even worry about uh, any type of billing. So mm -hmm. that was a very good question. Yeah, that's great. Our next question, uh, and I, I like this question quite a bit. So the next question is from Kareen, and I'm, I'm sorry to anyone today. I'm just going to throw that disclaimer out. If I mispronounce your name, it's because my brain is working way too fast, and, and I, I'm just, just not going to be able to put all that together. So I'm doing my best, but you can, all, you can hit me up afterwards and be like, you said my name wrong, and I can learn. Uh, but Kareen, this is a fantastic question. Uh, how can I create better automated testing in Firebase projects? My team struggles a lot with integrating Firebase to, into our CI CD. So, uh, Tally, you want to take the first? Yeah, I'll, I can take a first stab and then you can add to it. You know, I think um, it really depends what you're looking to test. So I'll mention a couple different options and then, you know, David, definitely add on. Keep, keep me honest here. So the first one that comes to mind for this would be Firebase Test Lab. Firebase Test Lab has a lot of really powerful functionality right out of the box, so that just by integrating it, you're able to get tests pre-release to make sure that you are checking some of your most important functionality. And then there's a lot of very powerful advanced uh, tests that you can add. So that is definitely a place I suggest getting started. In addition to that, we have app distribution. Now, that's a different kind of testing. I don't think it was quite what you're asking, but I just want to mention it here. If you want to make sure that you're actually testing out with actual users and sharing versions before they hit the app store, app distribution will allow you to do that on both iOS and Android. And you get some real user feedback, which, as we all know, is a critical part of the testing journey. And then. Yeah. I have, uh, one, I have one more in addition, just you, as you we're just going through going. this workflow. Yeah. So just one other thing, you know, uh, very often we, we are releasing something new, but we're not super confident in it, even with all those tests. And remote config can be really helpful mm. there because Good it point. allows you to slow roll features or roll out features to specific segments of users. So they're able to ensure that they are being adopted and liked before you go fully all the way out. So. That's just something else I wanted to add. What else you got? So I, you know, I'm just going to bring it back to the emulators. I, I wonder if I could answer every question that get asked somehow with the emulators, if I can just like you can make try. it. You can I can try. try. All yeah. right. So I think if I get deep enough, I can I can do that. Uh, so, so yes, the emulators are also another great place specifically mm -hmm. for CI part of that. So there's the CI slash CD. Uh, and so for CI, 
If you're doing things with Firebase authentication, which now has emulator support, uh, you can run integration tests that will run fully within the framework of the emulator. And so you could be doing Cloud Functions triggers. Well, that will work with the emulator as well. If you're using Firestore or real-time database, that also works. All their local triggers work. And so yeah. the, any type of integration test work and a Something that's always important to call out and to really emphasize are testing your security rules. That mm. is super, super important. And Very the critical. emulator, yes. And the emulator allows that, the testing library, all of those things. If you can write a test harness that tests your security rules, run some integration tests, and then you run that in some CI pipeline, that really makes you feel so much better when you're rolling out. And then when you're doing all the things that Tally was talking about, on top of that, you're doing extensive testing. You're rolling sure. features out you know, uh, slowly, and you're also sending distributions out to users. You are, you are checking all the boxes. And that, yep. that is how you have success. Absolutely, yeah. So was that an absolutely, or was that an absolutely? OK, I'll, I'll stop. Oh, absolutely. man, I know. Absolutely. 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 All right. But I'm sh all right. I think it's time. I, think I, I gave you a drum. What do you think? I, I could. I, I think I would probably mess that one up too. Uh, so the next question is from Nicola. So Nicola asks, how do you limit Firestore's reads and writes rates of not authenticated users? So I think I know this one, or do you, do you want me to take this one? Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. OK. So I have two ways of answering this question. Uh, so the first way is really with security rules. So security rules uh, have these magical uh, keywords or variables in them where you can check against specific values. And probably the most uh, commonly used one is the auth variable, where you can check to see the currently uh, authenticated state of the user. And that, could be not authenticated or authenticated. So in this case, you can say, hey, for all of this sets of data, so this collection or, or something like that, if this user is not, authentic not authenticated, they can't read it. And so that, that right there already totally gets them out of the picture and solves that in one big sweeping you know, statement there. But if you're looking for more finer grain control, maybe rate limiting what users, uh, not authenticated users, have access to, then you will need to use a cloud function to have that type of control. To uh, so for every call, seeing what kind of access it goes to that. So those are my two ways. The security rules really covers like 99% uh, uh, of most people's cases. Uh, so I think that should help you. But yeah, that, that's that's what I'd do. Yeah, totally. All right, so our next question is from Rakesh. Rakesh asks, how can I configure my Cloud Functions tests to run, that's right, against the emulator? I know how to run the emulator, but I can't run tests against it. They still run against the live project. All right, Rakesh. Uh, actually, Tali, you mind if I take this one right off? Yeah, so, I mean, you you wanted to do emulator for every question. So I really it did. feels like mean to take it away from you. I, I, I really appreciate that. That's truly kind of you. Um, so what? Uh, so this is actually something that um, you want to make sure your ports are lined up with the emulator. So uh, if you misconfigure the emulator in some way, or maybe it just like get the wrong port number, it can kind of trick you up. So what I recommend doing is starting from the top and do a Firebase init emulators. And this is going to go through the emulator initialization wizard and make sure that everything is good to go. You selected everything. Uh, you may not have selected the uh, functions emulator, so it might not know to run. Right. You may have accidentally uh, deselected it. Um, so make sure you've selected it there. Then check to see that you have the, what the port is. That will be located in firebase.json. And then when you run firebase emulators colon start, and then check that grid that gets displayed on the screen. Make sure that that functions one is displaying. And then if it is, you will see all of the uh, endpoints and everything printed out as well. And also the uh, Firebase uh, emulator UI in the logs will also show you in the logs that those emulators are running. And you can search for them 
uh, in the fuzzy search by name. And so you can really see that they're up there and running. Uh, and then from there, you should be good to go. So I would follow all of those steps. Uh, in your case, it's probably a port number might be mislabeled, like uh, off by one error, or you might not have it enabled, but you think you did, and it's just something slight like that. Because outside of that, there's no uh, connector code you need for the uh, Cloud Functions emulator, uh, unlike some of the other client SDKs. So those are the things I would do. And if you missed some of those steps, because that was your great list, always check out the Firebase docs where you'll be able yes. to see them summarized and some debugging tips there as needed. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, we just had a big update to the emulator docs because of the auth emulator show. So yeah, that's very, so always exciting. Good the docs. So our next question is from Sinisha. I hope I said that right. Again, you have every right to come yell at me afterwards. Uh, a while back, Google Analytics was replaced with Firebase Analytics, but now I see this as being called Google Analytics again. Is this the same Google Analytics as a few, a few years ago, or is this different? Mm. That's Allie, do you, I, I think Sure, is... yeah, I can take a stab at it. All I right. mean, um, so the answer is it's the same. So Google Analytics is still providing all the analytics goodness that you're seeing within Firebase. Naming is hard. I think we've had a couple different iterations, but in the end, it is the same. And as you saw in that keynote, in Firebase, we work incredibly hand in hand with the folks in Google Analytics to make sure we're able to show the best possible experience right within the Firebase console. Yeah, totally. Uh, and if you want a very, very long backstory on this, you can check out a uh, blog post written by yeah. Todd Kerpelman, and he did one. And then I thought it was such a good blog post that he came on to the Firebase podcast, which if you like podcasts Amazing. and me rambling like this, you should check out the Firebase podcast because those two things happen on that one podcast. Huh. And Todd and I had a, a big discussion about this exact question. So Tally's answer was spot on. And if you were like, I want to know more about the evolution of Google Analytics from 2005 to what it is today, we have all that fully detailed. I can on the give podcast. you the info. So I'm just curious. I, I've, uh, I've never been asked to be on this podcast. It's it's new. Okay. I, hmm. I, I've had you check your check your inbox okay yeah yeah i'm sure i just missed an email from you, you yeah, just yeah, did, obviously sure. yeah. it's, just, it's crazy course. time of the year you know really busy i'm sure i was asked busy. Oh. Oh. okay so we have another question now uh, <laughs> from idris idris asks i don't want to be looking at my firebase performance dashboard all mm -hmm. the time and get it again things to look at uh are there alerts or emails available to help monitor Oh, this is a, this is also sure. a tally question. Yeah, it's a great question. So the easiest way to do this today is to make sure that you're exporting your data to BigQuery, and then you can create cloud functions that are triggered off of BigQuery. You mm -hmm. saw that in the keynote specific to Crashlytics examples, but it would work for Firebase performance as well. But one thing I want to add is that we really know that this is an area we can improve within Firebase performance, and we're looking to add alerts. So it's on the roadmap, and more to come soon. That's awesome. And I, I do love the pipeline with BigQuery. There, I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like you without you know, there's so many BigQuery updates, and it's just one of those things that I think uh, if you want to do so many amazing things, uh, like you know, obviously yeah. querying, but integrations, it really becomes that glue between so many different Firebase products For and sure. cloud. I'm, yeah, can, don't have any, I got so many great things to say about BigQuery. That's a, that could be a whole nother ass Firebase. Yeah, we've, we've done a bunch of really cool, powerful BigQuery talks before. So if folks are looking for more information about how to leverage BigQuery to get the most out of their Firebase data, there's a bunch of previous Firebase Summit talks on just that topic. Uh, do you know who might have done those talks? Oh, I did one actually. Yeah, you, did you, one. Can, look, you can look. Um, I did a couple. You can look <laughs> me up, and you can find some of the talks. And I think you'll hear more about BigQuery during the summit this year as well. <laughs> I was really, I, I felt proud of my response. I'm like, you did one, because <laughs> I thought you did two. <laughs> there there yeah. are a few out there, you know, always happy to talk to people about this. It's true. I would definitely go check out Tally's talks at uh, previous summits and, and Google I.O. Those are really great. If you're looking to get started with Firebase and BigQuery, yes, I would definitely go check those out. They're amazing. 
Um, our next question uh, comes from Eddie Emmy. And this question, this question is a, this is a good one. This is, it's got some meat on the bone. It says, where do you see Firebase in the next five years? And Tal, you've just been ripping through these. So I'm- Things are I'm heating gonna, up. Things are, are heating up here. We're getting, we're getting into the big though. ones. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this is a great question. It's something we talk about a lot too. I can tell you that much. I guess I would start with what's most important to Firebase is our mission, right? You heard Francis talk about in the keynote, and that is to help developers succeed. So when we think about the next five years, what's really critical to us is that we meet developers where they are, you know, whether that be startups getting off the ground or big enterprises that are building businesses on top of Firebase, we want to make sure that we're supporting you. And even though this question is asking about five years, I, I'll mention that this past year went a lot different than many folks expected. And that meant that Firebase needed to stay nimble and pivot, make sure that we were supporting folks who needed to get out critical apps quickly. And that's something that we really need to be able to continue to do over the next five years. So we're watching those market trends closely. Uh, to be more specific, I'd say there's a couple of market trends that we have our eye on. One is a big interest in investment in games, how Firebase could do more to support game developers. And the other one that we hear about a lot from you all is machine learning, right? How can we leverage the power of machine learning? How can Firebase make it easier for folks to be able to use machine learning? So these are areas that we're continuing to focus on and we're looking into adding lots of cool new stuff over the next five years with the goal of, you know, in the end, making it really easy for folks to build and operate their apps successfully. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like, something that we've really looked at is uh in terms of we want to like if you look at something like extensions and like the stripe yeah. extension today we really firebase has always been since day one about lowering the barrier to development to, so to shipping to publishing your app just to building something uh it's just been like the core principle since day one and something like extensions uh gets you there just so much faster just less Yes. Less glue in between and more shipping and doing. And also because I found a way, we're also really big into tooling. So stuff like the emulators. Uh, oh, wow. Is, we got there. <laughs> we did it. I got there. I answered everyone with emulator. It's like all the way around. So yeah, but but on a serious note, their tooling is very important. So making your yeah. uh, development, like accelerating app development, making it so that you are getting done quicker, you're not stuck where, like figuring out how, how, why is this thing not working? Like, oh, right. like got to drop 17 debugger state. So, uh, yeah, I, that, I think that was actually a really good point that you just made, right? Well, you know, um, when we're thinking about how to help developers be successful, a lot of the times it is about taking the heavy lifting off their plates, right? Yep. We know what developers want to be focusing on is shipping awesome features for their users and not all the other stuff that really goes into making an app successful. So the more we can do to help and automate and be opinionated about how to do that successfully, hopefully the more time developers can spend doing what they love. Absolutely. All right. Well, it's, I could spend I could spend another five years on that question. Oh gosh, I have to stop. But uh, I just <laughs> I'm I'm buying you a drum. I'm gonna I, show it to you. But we have a next question from Daniel, and Daniel asks: Is it possible to simplify automated testing of Firebase authentication? Mm -hmm. Things like email sign-in, account merging, and such are quite hard to keep tested. Now, Tally. I'm going to give you one. I so appreciate this. You know, oh. I know you want to answer this question. I can, I can see you're like, I know the answer to this. Give what, me, what, I know the answer. How are we no. going to answer this question? I mean, I'm, is it, I think it's the emulator. Well, let's, you know, I think, first of all, it's a good question. And, and to be honest with everybody, this is something that's been really challenging in the past. So mm -hmm. we're really excited for some of the announcements you saw today. And with the emulator, you're going to be able to run off locally, which means that you can actually much more easily build integration tests. So we are hoping that now with this new release, folks will be able to solve this problem much easier. 
Yeah, absolutely. It becomes so much easier if uh, if you like to do automated testing with things mm -hmm. like uh, if I'm a web developer, so all my examples are usually web based. Uh, Cypress IO is a really nice tool, or like WebDriver, something like that allows you to do UI automated testing. Uh, mm -hmm. You can do that, and you can do it all knowing that all of your code even on the Firebase side, is running locally. So the user that's being created uh, is running locally and then saving data against their UID and Firestore or the real-time database is done locally. So right. there's so many just fast automated tests. You're not worried about hanging around in CI, dealing with flaky tests and stuff like that. Just Nobody just, wants to do that, you know? No, no. I, I have spent plenty of my time dealing with uh, integration tests where you could just be like, okay, it's running time to make a sandwich, eat the sandwich, drink my coffee, and then- All the you free know, time. Yeah, you just get so much free time. We're, we're gonna take that time away, <laughs> but it's a good thing. So yes, I, I'm really, uh, yeah, the emulator, auth emulator is really gonna help you with all the, the, the testing there. So definitely yeah. check that out. Another great reason why if you are using a test Firebase project that you, know, you have to connect out to, uh, to start using the emulator. It is not only faster in terms of local development, uh, it's a no network, you know, connections and no latency. It's also mm -hmm. the the development tools that are given to you in the emulator are great and they are development specific. So move on to the emulator. Can't say it enough. Totally. Awesome. So we have another question uh, from Paul. Paul asks, how do I get or set admin claims with Firebase off on Flutter? Mm. So uh, Tally, do you? Uh, you take this one. Say this one. I, okay. I, I stole your last emulator <laughs> question, so I feel like you need to take this one. Do you know how I'm going to answer this question, Tally? You know, I, I really don't. I, it just, I have no idea how you're going to answer. I'm excited to hear. Well, with the admin SDK, uh, you can. I think that was because that I was going to say the emulator. Yeah, but that was a good. That was very good. Yeah. I did a little little sneak there. Uh, so with the admin SDK, you can add uh, custom claims. So you can run an auth trigger that when a user signs up or based upon something, you can add the claims usually in a cloud function. I am not completely sure uh, off the top of my head if there is actually a certain spot with the client SDKs, because this would be the same for Flutter. Uh, iOS, Android, you know, they're all mirror, very similar APIs. There's probably someone in the chat, probably Yu Chen or someone being like, actually, you can do this right now. But I'm not aware of any client SDKs off the top of my head that you can add uh, custom claims with. So you can do that off a trigger with the admin SDK. But if you're looking for a way to test this to make sure that you have it right, the emulators allow you to provide uh, custom claims in the UI. So there's a nice little text box where you can say with the new auth emulator UI, hey, these are my custom claims, save it. And so you can test that locally, which is really fast and efficient. So true to my word, answered it with the emulator still. <laughs> that was great, great answer. All right, so that that is all the questions we've had today, Tally. That went by oh, wow. fast. So I quick. know, so quick. So. Uh, Honestly, we, we couldn't get all to them, get, get to them all. We only had 30 minutes, but keep the questions coming because we're going to yeah. be in the chat with you all day today. So, Tally, that was amazing. I could not have done it without you. You were the MVP of this session. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was great answering questions, and I'll keep answering them the whole summit long. So look forward to talking to you all then. All right. See you later, Tally. Bye. All right, well, that, that is all the time we have for hashtag Gas Firebase Live. That was awesome. Those questions were really, really good. And I was peeking over into the chat, and I saw that there are so many more. So keep that coming, because after this, all the live sessions are coming through, or actually will be uh, sessions that we pre-recorded, but the speakers are going to be in live with you chatting and asking you, or you can ask them all the questions and just any conversation you wanna have, that's what we're there for. So we're gonna be here in the chat all day today and 
You know what's great about the Firebase Summit is that now it is a two day long event. So make sure to come back tomorrow morning, same time as today, which was 9.30 a.m. Pacific. And we're gonna kick it off with zero to apps. So if you like live coding or you like Flutter, uh, you like to see collaborative apps being built on the fly, then you're gonna to wanna to check that out. It's a, a really good session. So thank you all so much today for coming to hashtag Ask Firebase Live. And I can't wait to see you in the chat. Have a great Firebase Summit. Hi, I'm Melissa, a software engineer on Firebase. And I'm Maple, a UX designer also on Firebase. We're here to talk to you about monitoring your latest release. Building and releasing new features is critical to app development, but launching a new release can be scary, especially if it's for a major feature in your app or a totally new version of your app altogether. Leading up to a launch, your team can have a variety of priorities. For a brand new feature, maybe you care most about ensuring that the user experience is intuitive and that users aren't crashing at critical points. For an improvement to an existing feature, maybe your team cares most about technical performance, like the response time of a new API endpoint, because of the impact performance metrics have on app revenue, retention, and churn. And while new releases are an exciting time to engage your users by bringing them more value, it comes with the real risk of introducing clashes or slowing your app down. We know you have a lot of things to worry about already. That's why we've been hard at work building features to help you focus on fixing problems rather than finding them. Let's imagine that you're working on a shopping app and your team is releasing a new checkout experience. As part of this new flow, you've adopted a third-party checkout solution and the engineering team has five top priorities. Ensuring that users aren't crashing, that alerts are set up to notify you if customers are crashing, checking if the new feature has introduced any new crashes, that app start time is still fast, and because your checkouts are being handled by a new API endpoint, you wanna make sure that response time remains low for the core checkout API call. This can seem like a tall order, but don't worry, we've got you. We'll walk through each of these in detail and guide you in monitoring your new release to ensure a successful launch with Firebase Cashlytics and performance monitoring. Let's start with checking how many users are crashing in your latest release. You want to make sure that it's pretty stable. Let me pull up the Crashlytics dashboard so we can check on crash-free users. So by default, the Crashlytics dashboard shows you information for all versions. But since you're focused on the new release, let's go ahead and filter the dashboard by that version. All you have to do is click the filter button at the top, select the latest version, then hit apply. You can see here that crash for users are above our target goal. And if you want to check how many users have adopted your new release, you can do that by clicking here and going to the latest release page. Okay, so we just finished checking on your app stability and things are going pretty well. But what if things aren't going well? What if there's actually a big issue that's affecting a lot of customers? It's important to have alerts set up so you get notified as soon as possible. One of the most important alerts in Crashlytics is velocity alerts. Velocity alerts are triggered when 1% of user sessions are experiencing the same crash within an hour. AKA, whenever there's a high impact issue happening in a short amount of time, you'll get a notification. You don't even have to set anything up. To save you time, we've automatically enabled velocity alerts in Crashlytics, meaning you can get them sent straight to your inbox without any setup. And if you wanna get alerted even sooner than 1% of sessions, you can always customize the threshold. Since the checkout flow is expected to drive a lot of traffic to your app, let's lower the threshold. Let me show you how to do this. In Crashlytics, click on the overflow menu on the issue table, then select velocity alert settings. You can see that the threshold is currently set to 1%. That's the Crashlytics default. To change the threshold, just drag the slider. Since we want to get notified about high impact issues right away, I'm going to lower the threshold to 0.1%, and then I'll click Update Thresholds to save my changes. This means that you'll get a velocity alert notification as soon as a crash is affecting 0.1% of sessions within an hour. Now you might be thinking, well, I'm not an inbox zero person. That alert is probably going to get lost. It'd be nicer if I could get this in Slack. Well, we've definitely heard that before, and that's why we made a Slack integration for Crashlytics. We also have integrations with Jira and PagerDuty, so you can get notified in the tools that your team is already using. Now, with the Slack integration, 
You can set it up to send a notification to any channel when an alert is triggered. For example, you can set up a velocity alert trigger to post to a Slack channel called Latest Release. Here's what the notification looks like. To learn more about the crash, just click on the issue name. That will take you to Crashlytics. You can also set up notifications for other alerts like regressed issues. For more info on setting up alerts and integrations in Crashlytics, check out the link in the description below. Now that I've covered some alerts, we can go ahead and mark this one as done. The next thing we'll be checking is how to find crashes in the checkout flow. With any new release, your app might be crashing in a few different places. This might be the checkout flow, or it might be the onboarding experience. Let's say that you're really interested in knowing if your app's crashing for any customers who have bought something, since a big reason why you ship the new checkout flow is to increase revenue. In Crashlytics, you can see all the crashes that are happening in your app, but it can be hard to see which crashes happen to just customers that bought something. Luckily, there's a way to do this with custom keys and BigQuery. Let's start with custom keys. Now, you might be wondering, what is a custom key? Well, a custom key helps you track the state of your app leading up to a crash. Another way to explain this is that a custom key provides a snapshot of information and records the last known value. Here's an example. If you're a game developer, you can use a custom key to track which level a user is on before they crashed. And if you're developing a shopping app, you can use a custom key to track if a user has bought something or how many items were in their cart before they crashed. We want to see crashes for customers that bought something, so let's go ahead and instrument a custom key for that. To set up custom keys for iOS, use the setCustomValueInstance method to set key value pairs. For Android, use setCustomKey. Here's an example of how you might set up your key value pairs. After you've set up custom keys, they will start showing up for crashes in the Crashlytics issue detail page under the Keys tab. This is great if you've already identified an issue and need more info on how to fix it. I did mention earlier that you can get some kind of dashboard that lets you see crashes by specific parts of your app. We just did the first step where I walked through how to use custom keys to tag parts of the app you're interested in. The second step is to set up BigQuery. BigQuery gives you access to your raw Crashlytics data through an integration, so you can get more in-depth crash reporting and run custom queries. You can even set up ways to automate your release process. For example, you can run queries to see if any crashes in your beta and production releases cross a certain threshold. You can also run a query to see crashes by custom keys, like the one we just added. So how do we do this? To start, let's enable the BigQuery integration in Firebase. All you have to do is go to the Integrations tab in Settings, select BigQuery, then follow the steps to add the integration for Crashlytics. And even if you already use BigQuery with Crashlytics, you'll be excited to know that we recently launched the ability to export data in real time. We know a lot of you have been asking for this functionality, and we're really excited to see how real time will power custom workflows and alerts for you. To enable real time, just check off Include Streaming in your BigQuery settings for Crashlytics. After you've set up the BigQuery integration, you can run queries on your raw crash data, which means you can find exactly which crashes are happening for custom keys that you've added. Now, this can sound a little intimidating, and you probably want to get back to building your app. So to save you some time, we've made a Crashlytics Data Studio template that does the heavy lifting for you. That way you can focus on fixing the crashes instead of finding them. The template is powered by your exported crash data from BigQuery. There are four different pages and each one focuses on a different use case. Your crash data can be sliced a little differently from the main Crashlytics dashboard, which is useful if you want to see things like crashes by device, crashes by keys, crashes by file, or, or real-time trends. The template provides a solid starting point for your team, and you can always customize it if you need to. To use the template, click the Use Template button on the top right to link your BigQuery export data. I've added the template and some useful links in the description below. Now, let's go back to our earlier goal of seeing crashes for customers that have bought something. We'll do this with the Crashes by Keys page. This page lets you see all the crashes happening for any custom keys you've added. Just use the filters at the top 
to select your custom key. You can also select a specific version or adjust the date range as needed. Once the dashboard's done loading, you can see all the crashes for customers that have made a purchase. This is great to help you prioritize what's most important to fix first. And if you want to learn more about the issue, clicking on the name takes you straight to that issue in Crashlytics. And if you're using BigQuery streaming, new crashes will also show up here in real time. All you have to do is refresh the page. To recap, you can check on specific crashes in the checkout flow or any feature you've added by instrumenting custom keys in Crashlytics and leveraging BigQuery and our Data Studio template. Use these tools to monitor what's most important for you and catch crashes earlier so that you can start working on fixes sooner. Now let's dig into app performance, starting with our next key metric for this release, app start time. App start time is a measure of time between when the user opens the app and when the app is responsive. When you integrate the performance monitoring SDK into your app, you don't need to write any code before your app begins to monitor app start time and other performance metrics automatically. Better yet, the newly revamped performance monitoring dashboard makes keeping track of app start time easier than ever. Let's take a look at this in action. The performance monitoring dashboard has been freshly upgraded, providing a glanceable and customizable overview of how your key metrics are trending. For mobile apps, app start time is included on the dashboard right out of the box. On the new dashboard, we can see how the latest version is performing compared to your app's baseline. We can immediately see that app start time is not where we want it to be and can start working on improvements right away. In the meantime, if your app also uses Firebase Remote Config, you could turn the new feature on or off without having to redeploy the app. This would allow your app development team to work on fixes without some of the added pressure of knowing that users are having a bad experience at app start. If you want to learn more about rolling out new features with Remote Config, feel free to check out the link below. When the team's done, you can come back to the dashboard to validate if the fix is working for real users. And if the dashboard starts trending green, the fix is working. Now that this metric is on the performance monitoring dashboard, a quick visit to the dashboard is all you'll need to be able to tell if app start time is or isn't performing as it should. Having app start time out of the box is great, but what if we want to measure something more specific to our app? For example, what if we want to gauge how easy the checkout flow is to navigate, such as by measuring how long the checkout process takes? To do this, we can leverage custom traces. Custom traces are a bit like timers. You can start and stop a trace at any two points in your code to measure things like the duration of a task, such as how long it takes a customer to complete their checkout, or to count things like cache hits or retries. To track the duration of the checkout flow, it's as simple as including two lines of code. The first line of code is to start the trace, which we'll put at the very beginning of the checkout flow, and the second line is to stop the trace. We'll stop the trace when the user hits the button to place their order. And that's all the setup it takes to get this metric reported in the Firebase console. Next, you'll recall that the new checkout flow is issuing requests to a new API endpoint. For these new requests, our team really wants to be sure that network response time stays low. Performance monitoring reports metrics for any endpoint to which your app makes a request. These reports are called network request traces, and they capture the time between when your app issues a request to when the response from that endpoint is complete. Some of the captured metrics include response time, payload size, and success rate. Performance metrics for similar network requests will get aggregated into what we call automatic URL patterns. These are helpful for being able to understand trends in your network request performance. But in our case, we have an exact high priority request to monitor, so we want to make sure that insights won't get buried in an automatic URL pattern. To do this, we can create a custom URL pattern to capture the specific endpoint. With custom URL patterns, performance monitoring will try to match network request URLs to any configured custom URL patterns before falling back to automatic URL pattern matching. So by creating a custom pattern that matches requests made to our new endpoint, Firebase will aggregate the request data under the new custom URL pattern. To learn more details about URL pattern aggregation, check out the docs, which are linked in the description. Custom patterns can be created from the network tab in the performance monitoring console. Here, you'll find a big blue Create Custom Pattern button, which opens a dialog for you to input your pattern. You'll notice that the dialog provides some examples to teach you about the syntax rules for custom patterns. These options are helpful depending on whether you want a custom pattern to exactly match a URL for a particular call, or if you want to aggregate metric data for a bunch of network calls under a single pattern. In our case, we want our pattern to capture one exact URL, so that's what I'll type into this text field. 
Once this pattern is created, it'll appear in the custom tab of this table and will look like this until it starts getting data. Once there's data, we'll be able to see if response time is where we want it to be. And it looks like currently it is. But say you want to go the extra mile and keep a close eye on this over the coming days. This metric can be added to the dashboard just like other metrics. I'll go ahead and add this metric. Now, it only takes a quick glance to keep tabs on how response time for this call is trending. With that, we mark another metric green on our launch checklist. Now our dashboard has exactly the key performance metrics that we care about for this launch, and if we ever want to change the dashboard, we can always add or replace any metrics later down the road. And because it's so important to spot issues and validate improvements quickly, we're delighted to share that we'll start reporting performance metrics in real time coming soon. And with that, we finished walking through our top tips on monitoring your latest release. To recap what we covered, we started by checking on the stability of the latest release with crash-free users and Crashlytics. We talked about how to leverage important Crashlytics alerts, like velocity alerts, to get notified of issues sooner. And we were able to identify new crashes in the checkout flow with custom keys, BigQuery, and Data Studio. With performance monitoring, we customized the dashboard with key metrics to monitor app start time and to validate improvements made by the team. And we tracked the latency of a new API call in the checkout flow. We covered a lot of ways to monitor your latest release, but even just a couple of these techniques can go a long way towards making your app more stable, because after all, a successful app is a stable one. While you're working hard on your app, Firebase will be here to support you. Best of luck with your new releases. So you've built an awesome app or game that's become a huge success with hundreds of thousands or millions of users worldwide. You and your team are so very proud since this app has been your baby for the past few months, probably even years, but we all know it comes at some point. Yep, it's time to monetize using ads or other revenue generating strategies, such as providing virtual currency like gems or coins for purchase but figuring out the best way to optimize your app revenue can be confusing. You might have even had a meeting that goes a little something like this. Oh, hey, great job in that game you built. But you know that saying, money talks? Well, I don't really feel like your game is talking enough. We got to make some more money. So um, why don't you put in some more ads, like lots of ads, so many ads. Oh, but don't put in too many ads. We don't want to drive users away. Also, why don't we put in some of them fancy rewarded ads too, right? Like give players some gems when they watch a video, like make it a lot of gems. So they're really incentivized to watch an ad. Oh, but don't give away so many gems. People stop paying for them. That'd be a disaster. And people would probably get fired, specifically you two. Anyway, I think it was pretty clear guidance. So I'll let you get back to it. I'm a really good manager. Okay. So obviously that scenario is a bit of an exaggeration, but our fictional manager is right. Also, hi Todd. If you've got a Smash game or app out there, it's only fair that you generate some revenue for providing a great experience to your users. In our fictional scenario, our team has a game with two revenue streams, in-app purchases of gems, as well as ads that give away some free gems as a reward for watching the ad. The question is, how can we make the changes requested by our manager without negatively affecting our revenue streams and our user experience? These are complicated problems to solve. What our team needs is an easy way to measure, test, and validate proposed changes to our ad strategy. Ideally, that process should also only expose these changes to a small subset of users so that we can optimize our ad strategy before rolling them out to the entire user base. And that's exactly why we're here. We think we can help. I'm Rachel Saunders. And I'm Samit Chandel. Thank you all for joining our virtual Firebase 2020 session. In this video, we're going to learn how to test out ad experiences and how to optimize ad revenue using Google AdMob together with Firebase. Let's get started. OK, so let's go back to our manager's requests. And let's parse what they said into actual questions for implementing a new ad strategy. The first question we should answer is, what's the impact of showing more ads to our users? Specifically, we want to optimize ad revenue while maintaining our current user retention. And the second question is, what is the optimal reward amount, the number of gems, to give away in our rewarded ads? Now, with the second question, we're also looking at how our ad strategy impacts our other revenue stream, users purchasing gems directly. 
And to answer these two questions, we're going to use a combination of Google AdMob and Google Analytics, along with Firebase Remote Config and Firebase A-B testing. Uh, hey, Smith, uh, you think you could tell us a little bit about how all these products work together? Well, certainly, Rachel. First off, Google AdMob is how we create and serve ads to our users. Second, we're going to use Google Analytics to measure the impact of different ad strategies on key metrics like user retention, ad revenue, and in-app purchase revenue. And finally, we'll use Firebase Remote Config and Firebase A-B testing to test and compare different ad strategies by first exposing them to only a small subset of our user audience. This framework will allow us to answer both of our questions and beyond. Now, before we can get to answering those top-level questions that Rachel mentioned, we'll need to spend just a few minutes explaining how our framework is going to work. For now, let me pass it back to Rachel to tell us a bit more about using Google AdMob and Google Analytics. As mentioned earlier, our game is already serving a rewarded ad via AdMob. But if you haven't used AdMob before, go ahead and check out the links in the description to get started and create your very first rewarded ad. We'll be rating for you right here. Once you do have AdMob set up, you might notice that your account already shows some user metrics automatically collected for your ads. But we can do even more with automatically collected ads data by using the Firebase SDK for Google Analytics. It has a lot of useful features just by itself, but Google Analytics also powers Firebase Remote Config and A-B testing. So we'll be able to optimize the ad experience for different users. Setting up Google Analytics is pretty straightforward. Just check out the Getting Started docs, which are linked in the description. After getting set up, you'll automatically start seeing metric reports like these in the Firebase console. These help us to measure the impact of different tested ad experiences. But how exactly are we going to serve those different ad experiences to our users? Well, let's kick it back over to Submit to describe the Firebase products that'll help us accomplish just that. OK, first, let's start with Firebase A-B testing. Or better yet, let me provide a brief overview of A-B testing as a concept. The whole idea with A-B testing is that you have multiple variants of something you want to test, like a feature, an app flow, or an app layout, and you want to compare them side by side to determine which one works best based on a set of key metrics. For example, in a space shooting game, you might want to A-B test which version of the game your players enjoy most, the easier variant, where players have ship shields up and fewer alien monsters to fight, or the more challenging version with fewer power-ups and a lot more monsters. But in order to test these variants, we also need a way to create and deploy them to smaller user segments of our total user audience. And that's where Firebase Remote Config comes in. If you haven't used Remote Config before, you can think of it as a set of key value pairs that live in the cloud and that can overwrite default values already in our app based on different conditions and targeting of specific users. For example, maybe you have a new branding style that you want users to start seeing on a specific date. Well, you can configure that in the Firebase console, and on that date, each app instance will pull in and start displaying your new brand. This is a really powerful feature that allows you to change the look and feel of your app dynamically through the cloud without requiring any code updates or redeploys to the Play or App stores. This ability to target specific user segments and deploy different user experiences dynamically is what empowers Firebase A-B testing to perform A-B tests on different app variants, and report on the resulting key metrics. And with that last piece in place, we've got our framework ready to start answering some of our questions. Awesome. So let's start with our first question. Can we show more ads without negatively impacting our metrics? Well, to answer this question, we're going to need some A and B variants to test. And we actually already have one variant, our existing rewarded ad. What we need is a second variant, meaning a second rewarded ad that's set to display more often than that first ad. To create this second ad, let's go over into our AdMob account and select our existing AdMob app. Now, real quick, make sure this bit right here about linking to Firebase is done in your own app. Without this link, there's no communication between AdMob and Firebase and Google Analytics. And without those comms, you can't do any of the optimization testing later on. So if you haven't done, linked it yet, Take a moment to do that now before the next step. Now, let's go ahead and look at our existing rewarding ad by clicking on the Add Unit section and viewing it here in the Add Listings view. It has a name and an Add Unit ID. 
And that ID is going to be really important later on when setting up testing with Firebase. So make sure to remember where to find it. The other important part of this ad is right here in the advanced settings, specifically frequency capping, which controls how many ads are shown to a user over a given time interval. And as you might guess, we'll use this setting to differentiate our two ads. In this existing ad, we're showing one impression per user per 20 minutes. So maybe for our second ad, we could up this frequency to one ad every five minutes instead. Now, hopefully that, won't, that many ads won't degrade our user experience, but our Firebase testing will actually help us find that out. Let's go ahead and create that second ad, which will be our second variant for testing with Firebase. We're still here in the Add Unit section, and we just need to click Add Add Unit. We'll select Rewarded Ad and name the second ad Rewarded Ad More Ads. We'll keep the number of rewarded gems the same as the first ad, which was 1,000. But in the advanced settings, we'll enable and set frequency capping to one impression every five minutes instead of one impression every 20 minutes like we had in our, in our original ad. And now we're done. Before leaving though, don't forget to take note of where to find that ad unit ID. Now we need to actually do something with these two ads. Smith, could you help us out? For sure. So let's talk about those add unit IDs Rachel just asked you to remember. So an add unit ID represents the ad itself. Having different add unit IDs is what enables our testing strategy using Firebase Remote Config. Just briefly though, let's take a look at what a rewarded ad actually looks like, as well as how we use the add unit ID and code when creating a rewarded ad. So here's a sample rewarded ad playing in our sample app. It shows up whenever we switch between different tabs in the current view, and if a user watches the ad until the end, they get a reward. Let's look at the code that implements this rewarded ad. So in this case, we're looking at code for an Android app, but it will be very similar if you're developing for iOS or Unity. If you followed along with the getting started guides for your platform to implement this ad, the code you wrote will look very similar to what's being shown here. There are two key things to call out. One is how we're creating the rewarded ad via the create and load rewarded ad method. The other is the add unit ID that we're passing in as a parameter to that method when we create the ad. In the create and load rewarded ad method, we're creating the rewarded ad by passing in the activity context and the add unit ID. The add unit ID specifies which rewarded ad we want to load up. For now, we're using a sample add unit ID, but this will change soon once we start running our tests. Next, we're creating a rewarded ad load callback and finally, we're loading the rewarded ad itself via the load ad call. Okay, now that we know a bit more about how rewarded ads work in code, especially how they're keyed off the ad unit IDs, let's learn about how we can use A-B testing and remote config parameters to control which ad unit ID we load for a given user. So here we are in the Firebase console with my project open. Let's go down to the remote config section where we can create some parameters. After clicking on Remote Config in the navigation bar, I'm presented with a screen where I can enter the name of the parameter that controls the add unit ID. I'll keep it simple and just use add unit ID. Now, by default, the value we want to use here is the add unit ID of our first rewarded ad, the one that shows an ad every 20 minutes. So I'll paste that in. Let's click on Add Parameter now to create the parameter, and then click on Publish Changes to make this parameter available to our users. Now we're ready to create our A-B test. We'll click on this overflow menu here and select A-B test. This will open up the A-B test setup screen. And the first thing I'll do here is name the test and I'll call it add frequency experiment and then click on next. Now here's where I can make sure that only a small subset of our users experience our changes. Let's increase this target value to 10% meaning only 10% of our users we placed into this experiment and might see more ads. Now we'll click on next once more. And this takes us to the goal section of our A-B test. Now in our case, we want to increase revenue. So let's set our primary metric as estimated ad mob revenue. A-B testing will base its evaluation of our two variants on this metric. However, ad revenue isn't the only thing we want to keep an eye on. So we'll also include secondary metrics like user retention, because we like having users, as well as purchase revenue for good measure. And finally, I'll hit next. And now I can define our A-B testing variants. 
So for the control group, we'll use the default value, which is the add unit ID for our first warded add. For the second testing variant, called variant A, we'll set its value to be the add unit ID of the second rewarded ad, the one that shows ads more frequently. And finally, we'll hit review. Once we're satisfied with the experiment configuration, we're ready to start the experiment. But there's one last remaining step. We haven't wired up our application code to use the remote config parameter yet. Rachel, can you show us how it's done? Of course. Now, just a reminder, we're using Android and code samples in Java here. But this setup will be very similar for any other platform. As always, though, links to the docs are in the description in case you want to set up remote config for your own platform and follow along. So first, we'll instantiate the Firebase remote config object and configure how often to retrieve any remote config parameter values waiting to be fetched by our client app. And here, we're creating a remote config settings object via the builder and setting a fetch interval of about once an hour. Now, this interval is OK for our sample app, but in production, you might want to increase this so that your app doesn't exceed any rate limits in hitting the remote config servers. The next thing to do is actually fetch and activate our remote config parameter values. This call will retrieve any pending values for a client, as well as have remote continue checking for updates going forward. OK, with all that done, let's actually use that remote config parameter that we created in the Firebase console just a bit ago. Quick reminder, it was called add unit ID. We'll go ahead and call get string from our remote config instance and pass in the add unit ID key. Now this key will have the same value as our parameter name, add unit ID. The get string call will return whatever value for that parameter remote config retrieves for this app instance, which will be one of our ads add unit IDs. We'll store that value in a string we'll call add ID. Now with this configuration, the value of add ID for each user will actually be controlled by A-B testing. So if A-B testing places a given user in that lucky 10% in our experiment, that user will get one of the two variants, meaning their add ID will be either one of our two add unit IDs. If they get the second add unit ID, they'll see more ads. Now let's go back to the code snippet for our rewarded ad. We'll pass in this add ID value that we fetched from remote config so that we can create and load the ad variant that A-B testing wants our user to experience. And there you have it. We've got our control in place for which ad experience is shown to users. Firebase Remote Config and A-B testing will take care of distributing the ad variants to our target users just as we configured at our A-B test. But there is one last step. Back to you, Samit, for that final piece. Right, so we've got everything wired up and we've already set up our A-B test in the console, but we haven't started running the test yet. Let's change that by going back to the console and hitting the Start Experiment button. And boom, we are off to the races. Now, Firebase A-B testing can take at least a couple of weeks before it retrieves some meaningful results. But as time passes, we can always come back to this experiment summary screen to view the performance of our variants. Eventually, if one of the variants is clearly outperforming the other, A-B testing will notify us so that we can decide if we want to roll out that variant as the new control to the rest of our user base. Until then, though, we can also check out the improvement overview and the experiment results section to see if there's a major difference in ad mob revenue and user retention between the two variants over time. That wraps it up for how we can solve our first question, but we've still got our second question left to solve. And that is, what is the optimal number of gems to give away in our rewarded ads? Hopefully, we can increase ad revenue without compromising our other revenue stream in app purchases. Well, Samit, the good news is that since we've already built out a testing framework using Firebase, the setup to answer this question is quite a bit easier to implement. To answer this question, we'll need to eventually set up another testing variant in A-B testing, which means that we need another rewarded ad to associate with that variant. So back to our AdMob account to create that ad. But this time, let's increase the number of gems we reward. Here in the AdMob console, we'll run through the rewarded ad creation setup just really quick. We'll name this new ad, rewarded ads, 3,000 gems, and enter 3,000 for the reward amount. We'll make sure that the frequency capping is enabled, and we'll set this to the same as our controls frequency, one ad every 20 minutes. That means that we're not going to cross streams when we do our testing. And finally, we'll create the ad. And once again, we'll note this ad's ad unit ID. 
Next, we'll go back to the Firebase console to set up a new A-B test that has a variant associated with this new add. Back in the remote config section, we already have that add unit ID parameter here, and we're still running the add frequency experiment that we created earlier. But now we want to create a new rewarded amount experiment using the same parameter. So we'll click on the overflow menu and select A-B test. Now we'll set up this A-B test in exactly the same way as we did for the previous experiment. So I'll fast forward through that part. There is one key difference though. In the goal section, we'll set total estimated revenue as the primary metric instead of estimated ad mob revenue. We'll still include both estimated ad mob revenue and purchase revenue as secondary metrics though, since it'll also be useful to measure the impact to these metrics in each variant individually. And of course, we'll also include user retention as well. Now for our testing variants. For the control, we'll use the add unit ID of the very first rewarded ad that rewards 1,000 gems. And for the variant, we'll use the add unit ID of the ad that rewards 3,000 gems. Then we'll just hit review and finally start the experiment. But what's that you say? We haven't wired up the code for the new experiment. Actually, we have. Remember the previous code we set up for our first experiment? Well, we can reuse that code exactly as it is to run our second experiment and in parallel too. This is because remote config and A-B testing work together to provide different add unit ID parameter values to users while attributing them back to the correct A-B testing experiment. And what makes this particularly nice is that we don't have to redeploy our code or re-release our app to just run a new experiment for optimizing our ad revenue for our rewarded ads. Pretty cool, right? It definitely is. So now with a basic understanding of how all these products work together, we can start answering a lot more questions about optimizing ad revenue. Questions like, which other ad formats could increase our ad revenue? Or how can we target ads to specific user audiences, not just a random 10% of users? And we can even optimize which users get shown an ad and which ones are escorted to an in-app purchase experience instead. Well, we've got more good news for you. This video will be the first in an upcoming series where we can cover some of these more advanced topics. We'll also walk through some of the concepts presented in this video step-by-step -step for all supported platforms, whether that's iOS, Unity, or Android. So stay tuned for those and let us know if you enjoyed this content by dropping us a like or subscribing to the Firebase YouTube channel. Ta-ta for now. Bye. Getting users to download and start to use your app can be an all-encompassing driving goal. But what about keeping your users engaged and building on top of that initial honeymoon period? How do you make sure your app feels really personalized without constantly shipping new releases with increasingly complicated workflows? One way is by using contextual messages. They help guide users to the right content at the right moment. We'll be sharing examples of how you can use relevant and contextual messaging to grow your app building meaningful engagement and connection with your users. I'm Mega Bangalore. And I'm Todd Hansen. Thanks for joining us. We're both engineering leads at Firebase, though we'll see more from Todd in a bit. When trying to engage your users, you want to be able to really connect with them, not only when they're actively using your app, like providing hints in a game when they're stuck on a level, but also when they're not using your app, if there's some critical news that just can't wait we'll explore two distinct approaches to setting up personalized messaging, both in-app and out. I'll start by teaching you how to set up campaigns and nudges to guide your users to the features and sections of the app that are the highest value to you. Todd will show you how to send messages to topic subscribers via the programmatic APIs. He'll then dig into some advanced API use cases using analytics labels, BigQuery, and a new FCM feature, Direct Boot. But first, to set the stage. Todd and I are working to grow our latest app, a cooking app where users can discover and share recipes with friends. A lot of the recipes shared within the app come from cookbooks, and I wanted to launch a new integration to allow users to easily buy the cookbooks that feature their favorite recipes. To promote this integration, I created a sale where cookbooks were 10% off for a limited time. While we could send all of our users the sale notification, Todd and I are seasoned app developers and only want to send the right users this message. 
getting interrupted by an irrelevant message can be jarring, and we want to do our best to avoid that. We used a feature called Dynamic Audiences in Google Analytics for Firebase. For those new to GA for Firebase, it's a great way to track key client-side metrics. You get a lot of great metrics out of the box, but can also define custom ones. Dynamic audiences are one of Analytics' super-powered features. You can cluster your users into segments, or audiences, based on their in-app actions and behaviors. For more info on how to set up your audiences, and analytics in general, see the links in the description. I already have my dynamic audiences configured, so now to set up my messaging campaigns. There are two types in Firebase, in-app and cloud messaging. Let's use both to ensure we're reaching our users in the most effective way. But, you rightly ask, Mega, why are there two types of messaging and how should I be using them? Great question, my remote friends. Let's do a bit of comparison. First, to introduce the messaging types. Let's start with Firebase Cloud Messaging, or FCM for short. FCM is a cross-platform messaging solution that lets you reliably send notifications to your users when they aren't using your app, with SDKs for iOS, web, Android, and Unity. Let's say that I am tootling along browsing Stack Overflow when I get summoned back into my Photos app by this critical notification. What? There are chinchillas on the internet and no one is watching. My Photos app knows that I can't resist a cute chinchilla and that I love to see new photos instantly as they get added, even when I'm not currently browsing through the app. FCM is perfect for re-engaging users who aren't using your app. You're able to send a message to a user's notification bar and with the right compelling chinchilla-related message, bring them back. Firebase in-app messaging, or FIAM on the other hand, provides a fully managed UI to display messages within your app. Think a nice card or modal encouraging users to rate your app or connect their address book. For example, I'm happily using the app, and when I go to my profile page, this triggers a FIAM, encouraging me to add my hometown to my settings. FIAM is great for deepening user engagement with users while they're already using the app. So let's compare how these two are similar and how they differ. Who is eligible for the message? With both FCM and FIAM, you can use user segments or audiences. Additionally, FCM allows sending to topic subscribers. Todd will dig more into topics soon. When do they see it? With FCM, you control when the user gets the notification. With FIAM, your user's actions control if and when the user sees the message. If the trigger event is level up, but your user never does, they will never see that message. What do they see? FCM shows as a notification in their system bar, and FIAM shows as an embedded part of your app. And finally, how does it get to their device? FCM sends it on demand. When the user should see it, the message is sent. For FIAM, our SDK periodically fetches the eligible messages. Now that we're clear on the differences between FCM and FIAM, let's go to the Firebase console and see how you can configure your messaging campaigns. Both messaging tabs can be found under Grow. Let's start with FIAM. Now, if you wanted to run an experiment on the messaging campaigns, you could click here to configure the experiment details, specifying what variants to show, etc. To learn more about running experiments, which you can do with both in-app and cloud messaging, check the description. I already know exactly what I want to send, however, so let's just run a campaign directly. Not only that, with the power of some movie magic, I already have one prepared. Let's take a look. First, we start with what message users will see. There are four template types to choose from. I recommend the card type to start with. There are a few more guardrails to help make your message look great. You can configure the text and background colors, set the message title and text, as well as preview the message over here on the right. Here I linked the image that I want displayed. You can use Firebase storage or hosting or really any URL to host the image and note if you wanna have different images for landscape or portrait orientations. I would strongly recommend you make sure that whatever is hosting the image is ready for scale and fronted with a CDN though. We want to ensure that all your users will be able to see it. Here's the primary button click link. This takes users directly to the sale page with details on how the cookbook promo code works. You can put a Firebase dynamic link here or use any other deep linking tool you've configured in your app. Next, we define who will see the message in target. 
I want users who had not bought anything in the last seven days and who were seen in the app in the last week. Here I use the not in with my weekly active purchasers audience and add an additional condition for app activity. You can construct any combination of audiences, user properties, etc., to configure the group eligible to receive this message. You don't need a special audience per campaign. You can also define localization options, either automatically powered by the Google Translate API or manually curated by your own localization team. My Italian in-laws are big fans of my app, so I can use Google Translate to provide a translated message that will be sent to all devices set to Italian. The default text will show up for any language that doesn't have a specific translation defined. Next, we define when a user is eligible for this message and when they can see it. I want this to be a limited run, so I can set the end date for this campaign here, but more importantly, I set the triggering event. This is the local event that is used to trigger the message display. I want these messages displayed when the user fires the recipe favorite event and to only show once per device to avoid feeling spammy. If it were a critical terms of service update though, I might wanna configure this message to show once per day on app foreground for the week leading up to the change. Now, the reason for this campaign was to increase in-app purchases. So I specified the relevant conversion event here so we can track this as part of our campaign stats. In additional options, there are fields for custom data that can be sent with each in-app message. This is metadata that you can programmatically act on on device. I want to immediately change the app when a user clicks on the message. And by defining in-app messaging callbacks and specifying this custom data, I can. See the details for more on handling callbacks in your app. The campaign is now ready to go live, but first there's a review summarizing the key details to do final verification before it's published. Now to configure the FCM campaign. This is actually really similar to the in-app configuration, so I'm just gonna highlight the important differences. Like before, we start with what your users will see. Next, we go to who will get this message, which has the option to pick a user segment, as we had in FIAM, but also by topic, unique to FCM. Since we want to use analytics audiences, we'll stick to user segment. We specified that the last user app engagement should have been over a week ago. This way, we're ensuring that weekly active users are getting the in-app message, but our less active users are getting a notification. It's not necessary to create these disjoint conditions between in-app and cloud, but this way we can ensure that we bias towards the contextually triggered in-app message where possible. Users are already in your app with the right mindset to explore more. When we choose the when users will receive this message, we can also configure it to either use your time zone or the device's local time. If I want a nice morning digest to show up at the right time for both people living in California and Italy, Recipient time is what I select. Speeding through here, we see our friendly review screen and publish to make it live. Clicking on any of the campaigns in either the FCM or FIAM dashboards will show the activity of the campaign. In this case, since we've just scheduled these campaigns, these are still empty. Now we've got both our messaging campaigns scheduled and ready for when our sale goes live, and we're able to engage with our users. Let's check in with Todd, who will tell you about another messaging challenge that we tackled, using FCM topics to send timely messages via the programmatic API. Thanks, Mega. Early Saturday, as I'm planning my menu for the week, I need to figure out a special dessert to share at my Scrabble game later that evening. As I'm scrolling through our cooking app, looking for ideas, it occurs to me that I do this every Saturday, and that others probably do too. Perhaps there is an opportunity to send some inspiration to people that fits their schedule. On Monday, Meg and I are back in the office, Mm, video chat. Together we start brainstorming a subscription push service for recipe ideas. Users can subscribe to different feeds of recipes that can be delivered any day of the week. Mega suggests that we use FCM Topics subscriptions to manage these messages. It keeps our infrastructure simple. We just push the messages to each topic at the right time, while FCM takes care of managing memberships and fanning out messages to interested users. The whole thing can be automated pretty easily, saving us time for outdoor activities. To subscribe a device to a topic, it only takes a single asynchronous call to the subscribe to topic function. A single call enables FCM to manage your subscribers for you. When it comes time to send a message to a topic, you can simply call admin SDK's set topic function. 
After you send a topic message to FCM, the FCM server handles fanning out messages to each subscriber for you. Those previous examples were for Android, but I want to ensure this feature works well for different users. Using the FCM v1 API, I can create different messaging experiences for different platforms. As you can see, each platform gets the upper level parameters unless overridden in the platform specific sections below. Mega is super excited to find out that we even support watchOS and Wear OS. Maybe that can be useful when it is time to create an awesome shopping experience. Our new feature launches to an enthusiastic audience. Users are happy to control their recipe subscriptions and happy to engage with our app's content on their schedules. This is a good start, but if we look deeper, we can find more optimizations that we can do to improve our app. Let's examine some of those opportunities. First, we'll look at using analytics label to gather message delivery and open counts to understand which subscription feeds are the most engaging. Simply add the analytics label parameter to your v1 send message calls. You can specify different labels for each topic up to 100 labels total. After adding an analytics label, we can view the results in our reporting dashboard. In this case, I am showing the send, received, and open counts for the Monday lunch subscriber base. It seems to be sending the weekly message daily, so I had better go fix the code. I can go a step further and debug specific message delivery issues using BigQuery. BigQuery logs specific events for individual messages, such as message acceptance and delivery. Using BigQuery data helped us to find out about Direct Boot's impact on our app. When an Android device's OS is updated overnight, it is unable to receive notifications until the device is unlocked. By adding Direct Boot support to our app, we are able to greet our customers when they wake up even before the device is unlocked. One aspect we are looking forward to exploring is driving acquisition of new users to our app using Firebase dynamic links. When a user wants to share a recipe, we can make it easier by including a share button within our app. If we use Firebase dynamic links, the share button can link users directly to the in-app content they want. If a user follows a shared link that doesn't have an app installed, it brings them to the app store to install the app and then directly to the shared content. This makes it easy for the end user to consume the content with minimal hassle and it brings additional users to our app. FDL also drives re-engagement by bringing idle users back into our app naturally whenever their friends share a new recipe. As you can see, Firebase Dynamic Links is a part of our diverse set of tools for engaging and growing our user base. Thanks for joining Megan and I today as we examined how our recipe app uses Firebase messaging products to engage its users. We examined setting up campaigns using FIAM and FCM. We explored using topics to distribute user-selected content, and we investigated advanced concerns such as direct boot, analytics label, BigQuery data export, and Firebase dynamic links. Stay safe. We look forward to meeting you in person at our next FireConf.
Hi everyone, my name is Malcolm, and today Sam and I will be talking about Firebase authentication. Hi folks, I'm Sam. Malcolm and I work together on Firebase, and in our time, we've seen quite a few of the patterns and anti-patterns that people come across when building their apps with Firebase. We're going to cover a lot of ground today and get into the nitty gritty of how auth works. A quick shout out for the super advanced developers out there who are already thoroughly familiar with our auth products. At the end of this video, we'll be delving into custom auth, which is super flexible, super powerful, and unlocks many interesting integrations. With that note out of the way, let's dive in. In my free time, I develop and maintain my own social cat picture sharing app. Now, I've only worked on Firebase auth team for a few months or so, so I'm still getting up to speed. Malcolm has helpfully offered to walk me through some of the technical challenges and decisions I'm dealing with. Happy to help. When I was starting out, I went with the most straightforward authentication, email and password. It's pretty great, very simple to set up, but I've started noticing some limitations with it. What's wrong? Well, for one thing, I was recently chatting with a friend who's big into app security. She was saying that many people use the same passwords everywhere. She was also talking about all the different password strength checks you can implement, and that got me wondering. Yeah, Firebase will give you some basic level of password strength requirements, but if you want to have your own configuration, you'll need to do that yourself. And as far as password reuse, that is a really big concern. Unfortunately, that's also something you'll need to build on your own. You could do both of these things as client-side validation, but ultimately, if you want to actually have real enforcement, this also means running validation on your own service. Ah, okay, that's good to know. The other problem I've been having is that people have been signing up with fake emails. I know they're fake because they use bogus domains. Someone even signed up with my work email address. I know it wasn't me because I'm a good employee who definitely does not use social media on his working hours. I set up email verification to address this, but my code is getting pretty complicated. You know, Sam, there's a way to address all of these concerns without having to set up your own server-side code. Email link-based authentication solves many of these problems. Your users would put in their email addresses, then they would receive an email with a link to sign into your app. Right away, that user has a verified email, so you don't need to worry about bogus emails or account squatting. They don't have a password, so password reuse and complexity requirements are no longer a concern. And the code is even slightly less complicated than doing a separate verification flow. Oh, this is great. I see. So with just these few lines of code, I get all of those benefits. Now, if I wanted to allow users to create a password after all, do I have to give up this email link sign-in? Nope. You can always just call update password on a signed-in user with the new password. Then you can call sign in with email and password the next time they want to sign in. Just keep in mind that any validation you want to do on that password needs to happen in your app. Cool. I'm feeling much better about this. By the way, I've noticed that the emails that my users receive from Firebase are a little on the bare side. Is there any way I can spice them up a bit? While you can update some parts of the text content in the Firebase console, there's not a whole lot you can do to change the way it looks. Email is a complex system on its own, so Firebase only allows for a narrower range of customization. You can, however, generate your own out-of-band code and send the emails yourself. We have tutorials in our documentation that can walk you through that process. Ah, okay, I got it. My UX designer, who is my cat, incidentally, wanted to overhaul the emails for the site something like this. Sounds like I'll need to stand up my own service to send them. Yep, that's definitely something you'll need to use the admin SDK and some other mail service for. Wow, though, this is starting to get a bit complex. At this point, I'm standing up my own cloud service in order to have better looking emails and to enforce stronger password guidelines. When I joined Firebase, they told me it was serverless. Your auth integration is starting to get pretty sophisticated. You're handling UX for passwords and out-of-band email flows. You're dealing with password strength requirements. You're ensuring your users own the emails they've given you. While it's great you have dug into the complexity of authentication, you're in the cat photo sharing business, not the security business. Let's see if there's an easier way to delegate some of this complexity to someone else. Someone else? Like whom? Well, Google for starters. Google has entire teams dedicated to making sign-in work seamlessly. 
Plus, since they own Gmail, Firebase Auth will automatically trust the email account of any user who signs in with Google. Hold on, though. While I don't wish to denigrate my employer in front of a large audience, how can you suggest that their UX is better than what my cat put together last night? I mean, look how great it is. All the same. I'm sure your app has plenty of complexity in other ways. Why spend so much time reinventing the wheel? Check this out. We've already talked about how email link sign-in is related to email password sign-in. Well, it turns out that all of the email logins are just a special case of a generic credential-based sign-in. You see, Firebase doesn't actually care what the underlying type of credential is, so long as it's valid. Let's take a look. In the case of email password, it's the email password pair. You send Firebase an email and password, and you get back a user. For email link, it's the email and a short-lived out-of-band code embedded in the link that's sent out. You send Firebase an email address, and it sends an email. You then send Firebase the link and the email again, and Firebase gives you a user. For providers like Google, the thing you exchange for a user is an OAuth token given to us by the Google sign-in flow. This is starting to make sense. So Firebase Auth is really just a wrapper around some of these other types of authentication? Yep. I mean, there's a lot that goes into all of this, but at the end of the day, we're talking about a way to uniquely and securely identify users. In the abstract sense, that's what the authentication system does. Everything else is just a layer on top of that abstraction. Okay, I'm sold. Tell me how I'd go about integrating Google Sign-In into my app. Sure thing. So, to briefly reiterate, signing into Firebase happens in two steps. One, you get or generate some form of user credential. Two, you exchange that credential for a Firebase token. For email password, step one is just asking your user for their email and password. But for identity providers, that step is just a little bit more complicated. Oh, is this where you would use something like the Google Sign-In SDK? Yeah. How do you know about that? Oh, I had to use that a long time ago so I could programmatically upload cat photos to Google Drive. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> Well, you can use an SDK to get tokens for identity providers like Google, Facebook, or Apple that have pre-built SDKs for each platform. Then you can use the OAuth provider class in the Firebase SDK to package the credentials that you've gotten and call sign in with credential. Is that it? Don't I somehow have to let Google and Firebase know to talk to each other? Oh, yeah, good catch. Before you can use tokens from an identity provider, you need to go to the authentication tab in the Firebase console, go to the sign in method tab, and then enable and configure the identity provider. The configuration is a little different for each provider, but it should be clear to you what you need. Is that it? How do I know how to use the identity provider SDKs? Do I have to learn a different SDK for each identity provider I want to support? Well, that depends. The flow we've been talking about so far is what we call the two-legged OAuth flow at Firebase, where it has two distinct steps for developers. However, we do have a simpler way to sign in that's the same for all identity providers. That sounds great. Why wouldn't you tell me about that first? Well, it has pros and cons depending on the platform you're on. If you're just building a web app, what we're talking about are the sign in with pop up and sign in with redirect flows. You'll note that those don't make any use of any SDKs other than the Firebase auth one and are the default implementation. For Android and iOS, we have a feature we call Generic Identity Provider, or IDP, sign-in. It's a way to basically turn all flows into the web redirect flow on any platform, but that may mean that the experience is out of the norm for your users. It'll be up to you to decide if that meets your users' needs. I can't tell if that's simple or complicated. How does it work? Well, the coding part is relatively simple. You set up the appropriate secrets in the Firebase console and the IDP console, on iOS, you set up the appropriate custom URL scheme and then call the platform-specific sign-in method. On Android, that's start activity for sign-in with provider. And on iOS, it's get credential with. Okay, that doesn't sound so bad. But what's going on under the hood when everything's set up? Ah, so that's a little complicated. Check out this diagram. Okay, let me fill in the parts I can figure out. Looks like we start in the app and the first call goes out to the browser, then what? So in the browser, we first go to a page that Firebase hosts in your project that we call the auth handler. That page talks to the Firebase backend to construct the IDP authentication URI and save some information for the round trip. Okay, and I think I can guess what happens next. You go to the IDP so the user can sign in. Oh, 
And then I bet the IDP uses the redirect URL that we registered in their console, right? Bingo. And that's the same handler we used earlier. It marshals the data from the IDP and uses the information it saved earlier to redirect to the app. Once the app receives that data, it calls the Firebase backend with the credential it got from the IDP to exchange for a Firebase user. Just like the flow with the SDK. Got it. One last question. I've heard it's unsafe to pass around credentials between apps on mobile devices. I assume we're protected from that? Yeah. Firebase uses a variant of proof key for code exchange called PKCE, a standard scheme for protecting web-based auth flows on mobile. In short, yes, your users' credentials are safe. You know, in my free time, I also maintain an authentication service that uses uploaded images of cats instead of passwords. The pixel data provide a ton of entropy, Plus, it's just more whimsical than reusing the same password over and over, but slightly altering one letter. There is so much wrong with that statement. But if you have your own auth service, why are you asking me so many questions about auth? I don't know. Maybe I was testing you. Isn't this pre-recorded? I can just look at the answers in my script. This is getting too meta. My main question is, I really want to be able to authenticate my users in my social media app using my homemade authentication service. So far, everything you've talked about with Firebase has seemed very managed. It doesn't seem like there's room for my cat picture password process. Ah, but there is. Firebase Auth supports custom authentication. And when I say custom, I mean just about anything can be used for authentication. Remember how we talked about Firebase Auth just being a wrapper around some form of secure token? Well, that's exactly what custom auth can be. Firebase Auth deals in JSON web tokens, known as JWTs, pronounced JOTs, these underpin every Firebase user, whether they're signed up with email, phone, Google, or any other IDP. Custom Auth allows you to put just about anything in that JSON token, and that will be your user. This happens in two steps, just like the other auth flows. One, generate a custom token using your admin SDK. Two, exchange that custom token for a user. Whoa, that seems super powerful. How is that secure, though? Couldn't anyone just send in some JSON and call it their token? Good question. Jots are more complex than just a JSON string. They're actually composed of three parts, a header, a payload, and a signature. The payload contains interesting things like custom claims, last sign-in timestamps, and the user's UID. The first part, the header, just has some general metadata so that the consumers know how to interpret the jot. The last one, the signature, is the important one for your question. The tokens are signed by your admin SDK's service account credential, meaning that Firebase can distinguish a valid token from a faked one. Ah, so next you're going to tell me I need my own backend again. Well, you'll definitely need code running the admin SDK somewhere. If you want to stay serverless, you could put this in a cloud function, or you could stand up your own server like you mentioned. And whatever you do, don't put it in any code running on a user's device. But once you've reached that point, custom auth is easy. One call to this method with any JSON payload you want will generate a signed JOT. You can return that to your app, and your app can then sign in with it. This is really cool. So how this works for my system is this. My users sign in by uploading their cat picture password. My auth system returns a unique ID and some metadata for that user. All I have to do is add some function to my app's backend that creates a JOT with that unique ID, and I can even put metadata in there? Yep. Like I said, almost anything can go into that JOT payload. There are special fields that Firebase cares about, like UID. Then there's the custom claims field, where you can set extra metadata. Awesome. But how does that get used? Well, for example, in Firebase rules, you can look at the contents of the JOT to guard access to Firestore. Cool. So now I can guard access to my app's documents based on how many cats are in the password. Sure. But in reality, this can be used in lots of powerful ways. Specifying users as having admin powers, for example, is an excellent use of custom tokens. These jots seem almost too flexible. How do I know this is a safe way to do things? Well, for starters, jots are an industry standard. Plus, they're signed by a Google service account tied to your project. There's no way to create a valid jot for your app without going through your own code executing on a runtime you control. That makes sense. So I still need to be diligent about what I do with the JOT once it's returned to me from the admin SDK. Is the entire JOT itself the unique key for the user? No. The UID field is the only one that Firebase uses. 
So in your example, if your user changed their password to have one fewer cat, the next login to Firebase, the UID would be the same, but any other fields you set in the custom claims, like cat count in your example, can change. This is really cool. I know realistically my cat auth service is pretty silly, and in reality, it's definitely not something you'd ever want to actually build yourself. But I can see how you could use custom auth to integrate with just about any authentication service you want. It's definitely super useful. While it's not quite bring your own token to Firebase, it's pretty close. You're not able to log in somewhere else and talk directly to Firestore, for example, but by putting one call to create custom token in between, you effectively have brought that other system's token to Firebase. In fact, there's a recent Firebase blog post by our very own Kevin Chung explaining how to integrate Okta into your Firebase app. Awesome. Well, this has been super helpful, though I'm still mad about those email templates. I know my designer had her heart set on her mocks. Happy to help. I know authentication can seem complicated to navigate, especially when there are so many different options to choose from when selecting your sign-in method. Yeah, the diagram helps a lot. It seems to me that Firebase Auth is conceptually just a container around some form of secure and trusted token. It all just depends how managed I want the process to be. Yep, you can have any level of involvement you want. And if you want to do everything yourself, Custom Auth is just about as flexible as can be. Cool. It's been great chatting with you, Malcolm, and great diving into some of these more nuanced auth use cases. I'm glad I could pick your brain. Nice chatting with you too, Sam. Let me know if your new cat app ever takes off. Thanks, Malcolm. And thanks to all of you watching. I hope you've learned a bit about how Firebase Auth works so that building it into your next app is that much more seamless. Bye, folks. Bye. Billing. If you're building an app that expects to get real traffic, you're going to need to turn it on eventually. And for many developers, this is a proud moment. It means your app is growing up and is ready to be used by the rest of the world. But it's also kind of a scary time, right? This is the point where developers start to worry. How much is my app really going to cost at scale? What if I made some mistake that's going to cost me like billions of database reads or send my cloud functions into an infinite loop? So in this video, we'll cover some of the tools that you can use to find out what these costs are and be notified when usage seems higher than you expect so that you can turn on billing with confidence and still sleep at night. Now, as is tradition, anytime I talk about money, I'm gonna go ahead and start with my favorite part, the legal disclaimer. Take it away, lawyer Todd. Please note that all guidelines, code samples, and recommendations in this video are used only for demonstration purposes and may not be an accurate or complete guide to Google Cloud pricing strategies. Code samples are provided on an as-is basis without warranties or conditions of any kind, either expressed or implied. Your apps use your unique and might not benefit from the recommendations laid out in this video. Be sure to review the full documentation on the Firebase and Google Cloud websites to best determine which bonding strategies are right for you. Basically, read the documentation. Ooh, that was exciting. All right. Now I'll start by saying that I've talked to our product team and in practice, like 99% of their billing related support cases boil down to situations where a developer has accidentally done something to DOS themselves. Either they forgot to add a limit to a database query that has like millions of records, or there's some side effect of a database fan out that causes infinitely looping cloud functions. Now there are ways to fight this. The first of course is to test your code, preferably not when it's in production. And if you haven't given the new emulator suite a try yet, I would definitely recommend starting there. It lets you run nearly everything locally so that you don't get charged for all those reads, writes, cloud function invocations, or what have you, which means you can catch that looping cloud function before it costs you any real money. But your second line of defense is simply knowing when usage or billing is higher than you expect. The sooner you can catch these instances, the sooner you can take action, whether it's shutting down systems, adding additional logging, reaching out to support, or you know potentially doing nothing because it turns out you have a smash hit on your hands. So let's go over a few ways you can accomplish this. We'll start simple and basic and move on to more sophisticated solutions throughout this video. Now, for most of this video, I'm going to be using this sample app where I have a cloud function running on a semi-regular basis to read in a few thousand documents in my database. It's just enough to charge me a couple of pennies each day. Now, in this app, I am mostly focused on Cloud Firestore, which primarily charges based on the number of reads and writes you perform, and Cloud Functions, which mostly charges based on the number of invocations you perform. But most of these same principles still hold up if you were to look at, say, the real-time database, cloud storage, or so on. So let's see if I can get a little more information about my app's usage and where I'm spending my hard-earned dollars. 
So the first stop, if you're ever interested in finding out about your product's usage, is to just visit the individual usage tabs for each of your products. Here in the functions tab, for instance, I can see that I've triggered a couple hundred invocations per day. And over here in the Cloud Firestore tab, I can see the total number of reads I've performed since the beginning of my free quota period, which was basically a few hours ago. But I can change the range here, so I can easily see my reads in the last 30 days or since the beginning of the billing cycle. Let's look at that one. And here I can see my total reads along with writes, deletes, and active connections. Now note that in Cloud Firestore land, unlike functions, these values are cumulative. So sometimes it's a little harder to see individual daily spikes, but it does give you a better idea of where your values are gonna be by the end of the billing cycle. So these are nice and they're updated pretty frequently, I'd say about once an hour. But to be honest, I generally prefer seeing my usage data all together in one place. So if you go to your settings and click on usage and billing, you get a nice overview of all of your Firebase products, along with how much they're costing you, your overall usage, and how that's measuring up against your free tier. So here I can see I've spent 34 cents on Cloud Firestore and a whopping two cents on Function so far. I've used 68,000 reads, 22,000 writes, and I've used up two and a half thousand Cloud Function invocations for the month. And yes, these are different timelines because the free quotas are different. Cloud Firestore has daily free quotas, Cloud Functions has monthly ones. So just kind of watch out for that there. And if I click on any of these, I can see my daily summary of usage and how much of it went over the free quota, like this. So this is a pretty good start. Even if you were to do no additional work, you have a place you can visit on a regular basis to get a handle on your spending. And while this is certainly useful, and I do like how clean this dashboard is, I know some of you would like more proactive notifications around how much you're spending. So let's get into the next level of monitoring your costs, and that's setting up budget alerts. Now, I should note for a lot of this video, we're going to be spending time in the Google Cloud Console. And so maybe it's worth pointing out here that all Firebase projects are also Google Cloud projects underneath the hood. So if you're watching any of this and you're wondering, well, wait, do I need to go and create like a separate cloud project? The answer is no, you don't. This has already happened for you the minute you created a Firebase project. Now, if you converted your project to a paid one in the last several months or so, you probably already set up a budget alert the minute you upgraded your project to a Blaze plan. It's in a dialogue that looks a little something like this. But if you don't remember setting this up or want to change it or don't know what this does, don't worry, we'll investigate budget alerts a little further. So you can get to your budget alerts by heading on over to the Google Cloud Console at console.cloud.google.com and selecting Billing. And while we're here, let's uh, head over to the Reports panel for a little bit, because I should point out that there are some nice additional dashboards and charts here if you're interested in, say, seeing all of your billing costs across all of your projects, right? And that can be really useful, particularly as the number of projects you create start to grow. And you can filter your cost by product or even by individual action that the product charges you for. So for instance, if I just want to see my costs that relate to Cloud Firestore write operations, I could do that here. Uh, one note, though, is that if you do want to look at your Cloud Firestore costs specifically, you need to kind of select App Engine here in the product. Yeah, I know it's kind of a done for historical reasons thing. And while I could totally spend a lot more time here creating more sophisticated budgeting dashboards, I want to head over to our Budgets and Alerts tab where I can see the budget for my Firebase project. Now, budgets are, as you might expect, general dollar amounts that you plan on spending. And you can get pretty sophisticated here and create, say, one budget for all your projects or one budget per project or even separate budgets for, say, your Cloud Firestore usage versus your Cloud Function usage. Now, I'm going to stay simple here and use the budget that Firebase already set up for me when I turned billing on. It's this one here. I have a budget that covers just this project and covers all cloud services that might cost me money. But uh, maybe I'll give it a more expressive name than Firebase Project. There we go. Now, for the budget amount, I can specify a set amount or a budget that's equal to what I spent last month. And that might be useful if my app is growing steadily and I don't want to keep resetting this budget amount every month. In my case, though, I'm going to set my budget to a simple $5 a month. Now, down here, we have our budget alerts. And maybe this would be a good time to explain what budgets actually do. Specifically, all they do is send you emails if the amount of money you're spending hits one of these thresholds. And that's it. You'll get an email saying, Hey, it looks like you spent, you know, 50% of your budget. But these alerts don't do anything else. They don't turn off your systems or anything. And that is kind of by design. I think the issue is that if your project is getting a ton of usage, 
It might be because there's a bug in your app, but it also might be because you made like the front page of the New York Times. And in that case, you probably don't want your app to suddenly break. You want to, you know, keep that usage up. So I think the right thing to do here is alert a human and get them involved. So let me set up a couple of other alerts here. Uh, maybe just for testing purposes, I'll set off a budget alert when I hit 1% and 2% and 5% but I don't actually recommend keeping those around once you're done testing these alerts. What you don't wanna happen is to have these emails coming in so often that you start to ignore them. So for real app, I might recommend setting one budget for like 50%, one for 100%, and maybe one for when your forecasted cost reaches 150%. You wanna find that balance between informative and so many that you don't pay attention anymore. Now, right now, these alerts are emailed to anybody who has a billing role in your cloud product, uh, like the project owner, but potentially other folks. And you can go ahead and add more email recipients, although uh, the process is a little more involved than you might think. Uh, let me show you how. First, you're going to need to click this link notification channels to budget checkbox. Next, you're going to need to create a new monitoring workspace if one isn't available. And if you're like, what the heck is a monitoring workspace? The quick summary is that a workspace is part of the much more sophisticated cloud monitoring tool. Now, this tool allows you to monitor multiple projects across different cloud providers and send off different types of alerts when things look wrong. And to do that, you're going to set up workspaces that are able to monitor one or more projects. So right now, we're only using a small sliver of this thing, which is to set up a workspace containing a single Firebase project and one additional email that we can ping. And you can do that by heading over to the monitoring tab. At this point, the console should create a new workspace for your project. Although, if you have a workspace set up already, I've sometimes encountered this weird little situation where your cloud console wants to keep defaulting to the one you've already got set up. If that happens, maybe go back to your main dashboard and hit refresh to kind of lock in your currently selected project. I don't know, it only happened once for me, so maybe it's a non-issue. Anyway, once you're in a workspace, you can go into the alerting section and then click the Edit Notification Channels button here at the top. This will then let you configure all the ways that Google Cloud can alert you. Now, it turns out that budget alerts only work with emails at the moment, so I'm going to ignore most of these other sections for now and go down here to email and add a new email address. OK, that looks good. So we now have an email alert channel set up for this project. And yes, that was a lot of work just to add a single email, but we will be making more use of this tool later, so bear with me. So now that that's done, I can go back into billing, budgets and alerts, Pick that budget I had created earlier and add my new email address. I'll add the notification workspace that was just added and then go ahead and select the email I want and then hit save. Make sure you do that. So now everybody on this list, in addition to your billing admins, will get notified when your budget exceeds one of these limits. And if I were to wait a few days, I'd get a lovely email like this one telling me that I have now reached a new threshold in my budget. Nice. So this is some good progress. You're now getting emails when your spending goes over your alert threshold. And I find that these usually show up in a few hours. But you know this might not be enough. One issue I have is that if you set up lots of alerts, you end up getting so e many emails that you kind of ignore them. But if you set up too few, then you might not get these emails until sort of after the notification has been done and you've blown through half your monthly budget in a day. So is there a way we can be smarter about these alerts? And can we find more ways of alerting you than just sending an email? Well, with the use of a few cloud functions, we can do all that and more. See, in addition to sending emails, cloud billing can also send out much more frequent updates through a cloud PubSub topic. PubSub, if you haven't heard of it before, is kind of like a generic message passing service. Messages are written in JSON and sent along through specific PubSub topics. Clients that are authorized to listen to these topics can grab these messages and process them as needed. And it just so happens that cloud functions for Firebase can very easily subscribe to these PubSub topics. So what we're going to do is turn on PubSub notifications in our billing and then write a cloud function to intelligently process them and then, say, send off a notification to a Slack group. That all sounds pretty exciting, so uh, let's get started on that. So the first thing we're going to do is connect billing to a PubSub topic. And it turns out that's pretty easy to do. I'm just going to check this connect a PubSub topic to this budget checkbox. Then I'm going to create a topic. I'll give it a simple name like billing PubSub, and I will let Google manage the encryption key for me. Next up, I'm going to create a cloud function to listen to this topic. Now, there's documentation on how to do this, but because I'm using cloud functions for Firebase, the process is actually a little easier than what's in the cloud documentation. Firebase cloud functions are already set up with all the proper credentials, so I can basically just start coding right away. 
Now I'm going to go over this pretty quickly, but if you want to watch me like flail around in TypeScript in more detail, I'll probably turn this whole section into a Firebase semi-live video that maybe you can watch at a later point. So the first thing I can do is create a simple function that listens to our PubSub message in the billing PubSub channel, and uh, it'll print out some of the console. Now, if I were to deploy this and wait an hour, I can see what these billing updates look like by jumping into my Cloud Functions log in the Firebase console. And you can see it's a pretty straightforward JSON block. We can see how much we've spent so far, the last budget alert we triggered, our current budget, and the beginning of our billing cycle. So now that we have this information, let's do something with it. I'm going to pull this logic out into a handle pub sub function. And within here, we can say ping a Slack channel with the latest updates. Now we can wait another hour or two and see what happens. OK, thanks to the magic of cinema, it's a few hours later, and I'm starting to see a problem here. Looks like I'm pinging the Slack channel every time there's a pub sub notification, which happens every 20 minutes or so, even if my billing numbers haven't changed. So the problem is that these pub sub notifications are kind of stateless, right? Like there's no sense of what I spent in the past and how this current number compares. So how do we fix this? What if you want to send alerts only when your spending increases by a certain amount, or there seems to be an unusual increase in your spending? Well, in order to do that, you kind of have to manage state yourself. But it turns out we're already kind of nicely set up for that. After all, my app is already using Cloud Firestore and Cloud Functions, so why not use those to track my billing costs too? So I ended up writing a simple function like this. I decided to keep my previous billing information in a private collection, one that, thanks to security rules, is not viewable by ordinary clients. And then I can see, like, if our current cost amount is greater than our last one by a certain interval, well, I guess we know that's important enough information to ping our Slack channel with. I also added some logic to detect if we're in a new billing cycle by recording the cost interval start variable and then seeing if it's different than what's in our PubSub message. And if any of this is worth talking about, well, hey, we can ping our Slack channel and record the latest state in Cloud Firestore. And there's more we could do, right? Like, we could probably calculate our projected costs like this and maybe add stronger warnings if that seems to be going over our monthly budget. Or we could calculate the average spend rate of our project and send a stronger looking message if that seems too high. And so I ran this function, and the next day I got some alerts that look a little more like this. Oh, that's, that's much better. Well, except I guess that 40 needs a trailing zero, but you know what? Good enough. OK, like I said, I know I kind of skimmed through this pretty fast, but the point here isn't really to focus on my specific code. You're probably going to want to write your own functions based on what you want to do in your app. And again, I will pull this out into a separate semi-live video sometime if you really want to watch me code. And I should point out that while I'm just pinging a Slack channel here, you can go ahead and call out to just about any service that has a webhook from these cloud functions. It's even possible to have a cloud function turn off your billing and effectively disable your entire app if the amount you're spending gets too high. And uh, the Google Cloud folks have documentation on how to do exactly that. Although, like I said before, I personally would rather get a human involved at this point than automatically kill anything. I mean, if your app is getting a ton of traffic because it made the front page of Reddit, you probably want to suck up those costs and keep it running. But this option is available to you if you're so inclined. So I think we've made some nice progress here. But right now, these alerts only tell you about how much you're spending, not about where that spending is coming from. Some developers want alerts based on product usage. Like, what if there's suddenly a huge increase in my Cloud Firestore rights? Or are my cloud functions increased you know, 20 times for no reason? For these kinds of notifications, we're going to take a closer look at the cloud monitoring tool we visited earlier in the Google Cloud Console. Now, like I said, cloud monitoring is this amazingly powerful and sophisticated tool. It's designed to fit the needs of like very large organizations that might have hundreds of virtual machines running in multiple cloud providers and one insight into how all these pieces are working together. So if you're just using it to like see the number of reads sent to your Cloud Firestore database, it might feel a little overwhelming. It's kind of like piloting a 747 to go down to the corner store for a gallon of milk. Luckily, I'm here to help you make sense of all the different dials and switches so you can focus on the bits that you care about. So I'm going to go back to the Google Cloud Console. I will open up the monitoring tab. And uh, uh, oh, OK, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, help, is there a doctor in the house? You called? Oh, hey, look, it's Yuri from the hit YouTube series Stack Doctor. Hey, uh, where, where's your lab coat? Uh, you know I'm not an actual doctor, right? Really? Because I had this rash they kind of wanted to show you. Uh, and Please don't. Uh, what do you actually need help with? All right, fine. Uh, let's go back to the screencast. So Yuri, I want to know how many reads my Cloud Firestore database is making at any given time. 
How do I find that out? Well, first, go ahead and open up the Metrics Explorer panel in the console. Uh, this lets you quickly create charts for the metrics you care about. So for instance, select Firestore document reads from the drop-down list uh, to view the document reads for your database. OK. Well, I see some data, but this doesn't really make any sense to me. All right. Go ahead and change your time span up at the top to one day. This should make it easier for you to understand what you're looking at. Oh, OK. Yeah, there's definitely more of a pattern now. Uh, but I'm not sure this really answers the question of how many reads did I pay for in like the last half hour. How do I figure that out? All right. So to really generate the chart, um, you need to adjust three levers. Uh, first thing you need to adjust is the period. OK. And what's that? So right now, we're grabbing data points every minute. Um, that level of detail is good if you're trying to you know, figure out an issue. But if you're just looking to understand total volume, uh, you, know, you need to do something different. So increasing the period essentially smooths out your data. Got it. So right now, my graph is looking kind of weird and spiky because it's like capturing time periods where my cron job is running and then other times when it isn't. Uh, right. So change your period to 30 minutes. Uh, what this will do will basically group your data points together in half hour intervals and then combine them together. Uh, OK. Yeah, that looks a lot smoother. All right. So now you're looking at how many document reads per second your database is calling on average for each half hour. Gotcha. So it seems like I could calculate my total number of database reads for each of these 30 minute intervals by doing a little math for each of these 30 minute intervals by doing a little math. But what if I don't like math? I mean, I kind of became a programmer so I could make computers figure this out for me. <laughs> well, lucky for you, there's a way to do that. Um, go ahead and open up the advanced options. See that aligner drop down? That basically tells cloud monitoring how to group together the different data points for the data you've collected in the last half hour. Right now, it's set to rate. That's the overall uh, rate of document reads per second across each of these half hour periods. Now, if you were to set this, for example, max, that would be the most number of documents read for any individual call across that time period. Um, and count basically adds up the number of data points uh, across that period, regardless of their values. So in your case, you want sum. This will add up the number of documents that were read across all of your calls in each individual time period. Oh, OK, I get it. So it looks like here, my database read in about 2,500 documents in this half hour period. Yep, you got it. OK, so if that's the aligner, what's this aggregator thing up here? So if you had different lines in your graph over there, the aggregator will tell cloud monitoring how to combine them together into a single line. So in your situation, almost all your database reads are queries. So this is kind of hard to see. Those other lines are basically non-existent. Uh, let's switch over, to, uh, switch over to a better example. Uh, let's take a look at your cloud function executions. OK, uh, I'm going to do that in a new tab. I'll select function executions here in my resource type, set the period to 30 minutes, select one day up on top here, and turn on the sum aligner like before. And ah, OK, so I see I have two lines here, basically, one for each of the two cloud functions that I'm running. And I'm guessing most developers are going to see a lot more lines. <laughs> right. Now, if you didn't care about what individual functions were being called, but just care about your total cloud function usage in general, you could select the sum aggregator. And that would add the values of your two graphs together into a single line. Got it. And similarly, if I selected like the max aggregator, that would show me the cloud function being called the most. And I suppose if I selected the mean aggregator, that would essentially average these lines together to give the average number of cloud functions called per 30 minute period. You got it. All right. So uh, let me switch back to my Cloud Firestore tab here. So if my main concern is billing costs, I probably want both my aggregator and my aligner to be set to sum, right? Yeah, that's right. So cloud monitoring is used to measure you know, all sorts of indicators around the health of your project, everything from detecting errors, monitoring uptime, execution times, and so on. But if you're mostly interested in the number of operations that are going to cost you money, then sum is probably a good way to go. Uh, you know, but don't be afraid to try other measurements that make sense for your projects. Uh, if you have really spiky workloads, you might want to look at the, at the mean across a larger period of time. OK, makes sense. So I know how to build a pretty graph, but how does this help me? Uh, well, for starters, you can use these metrics to build your own custom dashboard. Uh, if you head on over to, to the dashboard section and create a new dashboard, uh, you can add custom charts uh, based on whatever metrics you'd like. So you could go ahead and add a chart of overall database reads or writes, or you know, maybe you want to monitor the execution times or error rate for a specific function. Um, that's something you can add to a custom dashboard. 
And, you know, I would really recommend getting into the habit of setting up a dashboard like this so that if there are any issues, you can quickly see what's going on. But if your big concern is uh, really about being actively uh, being notified when your usage is higher than expected, you're going to want to set up an alert. Ooh, that sounds exciting. Let's do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, head on over to the alerting panel and then create create policy up on top and then uh, click add condition. We'll start with the same metric as before. So let's look at fire, uh, fire store reads um, with a period of uh, 30 minutes and then aggregators and alignments both set to sum. All right. I'm with you so far. Okay. The next thing we're going to want to do is tell cloud monitoring when this is going to be a problem. So let's go down to the bottom there and then we'll say our alert will trigger if any time series is greater than, oh, um, 10,000 reads for three hours. Well, wait a second. What does this three hour value mean? I mean, I'm already looking at a period of 30 minutes. So how does this other time limit factor into things? Yeah. So here's the deal. Uh, your period might be set to 30 minutes, but for the purpose of alerting, we're evaluating that period every minute. Uh, I don't follow. All right. Uh, so let's say it's 1230 and you have a 30 minute uh, data period for the data. So at 1230, we're looking at the data between 12 o'clock and 1230. At 12.31, we're looking at the data between 12.01 and 12.31, and so on. Now, for each one of those 30-minute windows, there's the potential that you'll be in the danger zone. In our case, that would be if our total document reads exceeded 10,000 reads. So if we say that our alert duration is one hour, that means we have to be in the danger zone for 60 minutes in a row in order to trigger an alert. Now, you know that'll help us uh, avoid the occasional spike. OK, that's uh, beginning to make sense. Can we go over a practical example? Yeah, sure. L let's look at two traffic patterns. Um, in the first one, we have a single spike, um, let's say 20,000 reads at 12.15. Uh, in the second one, we have more steady traffic of 7,000 reads every five minutes for an entire hour. OK, so let me see. It seems like in the first case, we're going to be in the danger zone at 12.15, and then we'll stay there until around 12.45. Yeah, you got it. So that's 30 minutes in the danger zone. Uh, what about the second example? Well, let's see. I guess we start to be in the danger zone at like 12.05, and then we stay there all the way until 1.25. Right. So that's one hour and 20 minutes in the danger zone. Now, if you set your alert duration to 45 minutes, it'll actually ignore that single big spike. But it will let you know if there's sustained heavy traffic. Uh, and if you set your duration to 30 minutes or shorter, then you'll actually be alerted in both cases. Uh, basically, the shorter we set our duration, the more sensitive our alert will be to individual spikes. OK. Uh, does it ever make sense to have an alert duration that's less than our period? Yeah, so if you had a situation where our traffic had small isolated spikes further apart, you know, a shorter alert duration would be you know, a little more likely to catch those. OK. Um, this is all making sense, but also I'm lazy and I just want to know what the right thing to do is here. Can you just, can you just tell me? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it really depends on how much do you care about occasional isolated spikes and how much steady traffic your site gets. Uh, personally, I would set up two alerts, one for when things get somewhat worse slowly and another one for when things get way worse quickly. OK, well, what would that look like? Uh, sure. Let's go back to the console and find out. So now that I'm thinking about it, for the somewhat worse slowly scenario, let's go back and set your period to be an hour. Then set your alert duration to something even longer, anywhere from, say, 4 to 24 hours. You know, I'll go with 6 here. And then set your value here to be like 2 or 3 times what you would normally get in a 60-minute period. So in your case, maybe like 10,000 reads. Uh, click Add to create this alert. Oh, and let's go back and give it a reasonable name, like long-term heavy reads, so we actually remember what we're measuring. OK. And uh, what should we do in the way worse quickly scenario? Yeah, so here, I would go ahead and set your period to something shorter, like five minutes. Then you set your alert duration to 10 minutes and your value to, say, five to 10 times uh, what you would normally get in a five minute period. Uh, like something that would present a really significant spike. In your case, that would be about uh, 8,000 reads. Give it a name like short term read spike and we're good to go. Got it. All right. And listen, don't be afraid to treat these numbers as you need them. Um, you know, you're probably better, ha better off having your alerts start, out, uh, start off a little too sensitive and then turning it down over time as you get a sense of what your traffic is really like. OK, cool. So let me finish adding up this alert here, because I want to show the folks at home why we're going through the trouble of doing all this. You see, cloud monitoring alerts, unlike our billing alerts, have lots of ways to contact you. Here we can see that email we set up earlier. But let me click this Manage Notification Channels button, and we see all sorts of other options. 
We've got pager duty notifications here, Slack bots, webhooks, pub sub channels, and even sending text messages. Here, I'm going to go ahead and add a Slack notification. This will go ahead to my Slack page where I'm being asked to authorize cloud monitoring, and I'll click Allow. And then I'll configure it to contact that same billing alerts channel I set up earlier. So here, let me uh, refresh your notifications. And I'll ask it to send me an email, a text message, and a Slack message when this notification goes off. I think all those will definitely get my attention. Um, and here I can add an alert name like really heavy database traffic alongside some detailed instructions that maybe I want to send to my recipients. So that's useful in case you have recipients set up to receive these messages who might not know what to do or who to contact if they see the alert. OK, got it. So I'll save this. And you'll see that I could go ahead and add all sorts of other conditions to this same alert policy. For instance, I could add conditions for when my Cloud Firestore writes get too high in addition to my reads. Um, in fact, let's do that. All right, there we go. Uh, say while I'm at it, I should probably also add an alert for when my Cloud Function invocations get too high. And it seems like I have two options here. I could either put them as additional conditions into the same alerting policy, which would then mean I use the same alerting channels if any of these conditions were triggered, or I could put them in a completely separate alerting policy. So uh, Yuri, when does it make sense to group these different conditions into the same policy? And when should I just create different policies? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, Generally, I don't recommend that folks have very complicated policies with lots of conditions. Their alerts should be very easy to understand by the person who receives them. So they should know exactly what the signal is that tripped the alert, You know, rather than having to figure out which of these 10 possible conditions did it. Gotcha. Well, maybe I'll make this a separate policy for now. So I have one for database usage and then another for cloud function usage. OK, now I'm going to go ahead and do something that's probably really frightening to a lot of our users out there. I'm going to activate a couple of cloud functions that are set up to accidentally run in an infinite loop. And then after I've confirmed that they're running in my console, I'm going to step away from my computer. I know, I'm, I'm as nervous as you. But I will see you all as soon as cloud monitoring has sent me an alert. Well, that didn't take long. I got a couple of text messages and some very worried Slack alerts that my usage has spiked. I also received an email in the account that I specified in the notification channel. But you'll notice that, unlike a budget alert, I didn't get one automatically sent to the account owner. It's only sent to the address that I specified. You know That probably makes sense in a larger organization, but definitely keep that in mind. So I'm going to go ahead and turn these functions off. And through the magic of YouTube editing, I'm now getting alerts that my database crisis has been averted, and my big, red, scary emails are now happy green ones. So this is pretty good. I've gone and set reasonable limits, and I think I'd feel pretty comfortable making my app public at this point. Uh, Hey, Yuri, what if I want to be smarter about this? Are there like fancier alert mechanisms that I could be looking at beyond what we've already done? Well, you know, there are more sophisticated options you could consider. Um, Cloud Monitoring has an entire query language that you can use to you know, run more sophisticated queries and then create alerts from them. So you could do something like uh, create a number of database reads divided by connected clients query and then you know, create alerts if that gets too high. Um, there's also a time series API that lets you query all the data as well. So you could, for instance, run a cloud function that analyzes your traffic for the last seven days and then you know, alerts you if your hourly rate is more than what you'd historically get. But you know, these get pretty complicated. And I've actually found that for most developers, you know, particularly when they're first starting out, just setting a simple alert based on an absolute threshold is a perfectly fine way to get started. All right. These sound like maybe good topics for follow-up videos one of these days, right? Yeah, maybe. They'll just have to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah, maybe. They'll just have to subscribe to our YouTube channels to find out. Oh, good idea. And uh, I know we've hinted at this before, but cloud monitoring can be used for like a more than just usage alerts, right? Like, what are some other metrics a Firebase developer might care about? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for your database, you can also look at rules evaluations. Uh, if too many requests are being rejected, it might be a sign that something is wrong with your security rules. Uh, if you're using cloud storage or the real-time database, you know, both of these products have support for similar metrics uh, as Cloud Firestore. Uh, for cloud functions, you can look at things like error rates and invocation times in, in addition to just usage. And then if you're using BigQuery for your analytics data, you can get reports for, for example, how many bytes you're uploading or you know, how much you've stored. All right. Well, thank you for all your advice, Yuri. And thanks again for agreeing to look at that rash. It's, it's really been bugging me. Yeah, I told you. I'm not a real doctor. Don't send me anything. Oh, really? Um, uh, well, may maybe don't open that text then. Sorry. So there you go. What have we learned? 
Well, if you need basic information about your product usage, start with Firebase Dashboard, both the usage panel of the products themselves and that very nice summary view in the billing section. Budgets are a good starting point for getting notified by email if you're spending too much on your app, but adding a pub sub to your budget and then doing some smart processing with the cloud function can give you much more flexible alerts with a little custom engineering. And if you want to be notified about overall usage for any product, cloud monitoring is a really powerful tool once you understand the basics. Just remember that aggregation is a let's combine all our lines into one function and alignment is a what should we compute over the last X minutes of traffic kind of function. And you can read about both of these in detail in the documentation that we will link to in the notes below. Alerts are very powerful, and I would recommend setting up some for some high levels of Firestore reads, writes, and function executions. And then we learn the difference between a time period in our metrics report and a duration in our alerts. So there we go. Uh, I hope we all learned a little something today, and I hope that you enjoyed the rest of the videos available as part of the Firebase Summit. So for me, Todd, on behalf of the Firebase channel. And from Yuri and the Google Cloud Platform channel. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you soon. Hello, everyone. This is Yu Chen from Firebase, and I am an engineer working on the emulator suite. Today, I'm going to talk about how to get the Firebase emulator suite working in your continuous integration. Well, that's a mouthful. What it really means is using the tools provided by Firebase to help you test your app and make sure your app is always tested when you change something. So talking about changes, Let's say you're working on an amazing app. Well, of course you are because you're using Firebase. Like when you change something to the app. Say one time after you change it, you deploy it to production and suddenly you figure out your app stops working. Yeah, that's stressful, but that kind of thing happened to everyone, including myself. But at Firebase, with the emulator suite, we got you. So what is the Firebase Amateur Suite? Well, it's a set of tools designed to help you spin up a local first, completely isolated environment for testing your apps. It's easy to see how it can really help doing local development, but the Amateur Suite also lends itself well in continuous testing and integration. And I'm going to take you through the process of setting that up. So by the end of this video, you'll have something like this on GitHub Actions. Whenever you push any changes, as you can see here, it will always be tested against your comprehensive test suite. So if you look at here, we push a new commit and oh no, it looks like it broke the test. If you'd like to, you can drill into its logs and see what tests are exactly broken. So if anything could ever go wrong, you can catch it before you deploy it to the real users. And once you fix the issues, you can push again and GitHub Actions will run your test suite again. As you can probably tell from this green check mark, the tests now pass. And now you can deploy with much, much better confidence. All right, let's take a look at the app we're working on today. As you can see, this is a typical e-commerce website where users can browse and add items to their shopping cart like this. Our app stores each user's shopping cart in their own document in Cloud Firestore for Firebase. And we use Firebase security rules to make sure nobody can change someone else's shopping cart. But what if when updating rules, we make a mistake and make it too restrictive so that users won't be able to even edit their own cart? You know what happens next. Soon we won't even have a business anymore. To make sure we absolutely get paid, I wrote some unit tests to get this important piece covered using the Firebase local emulator suite. Here's my project layout with my security rules here, functions here, and here's where I keep my tests. You can find all the code and tests on GitHub, and I'll show you the link at the end of this video. 
but let's take a look, closer look at these tests for now. So here, the first test simulates a user creating their own shopping cart and make sure it succeeds. The second test makes sure if they try to modify someone else's cart, it will fail. These tests run in the local isolated environment, in this case, the Firestore emulator. To learn more about how to write unit tests for your security rules, check out this video by Todd and Rachel at Firebase. So with these tests, we can make sure our security rules are well behaved, but what about other pieces of our app? For example, our website also calculates the card total for each user using a cloud function. As you can see here, the cloud function is triggered when shopping cart items are updated in Firestore. It then calculates the total and finally writes the total back to a Firestore document. We definitely don't want this to go wrong either, since users put a lot of trust into their transactions with us. And that's why I've covered these kind of interactions between different pieces with integration tests. First, we add some items to a user's cart in the Firestore emulator, of course. This causes the function we just saw to trigger locally in the functions emulator. All emulators in the emulator suite work nicely with each other. As the function executes and writes back to Firestore, it only changes data in your Firestore emulator, not production. That's some nice isolation right there. So if we listen to the card document snapshot, we will also see that the card total has been updated by the cloud function. Once that happens, we can assert that the total is what we are expecting. And that proves our cloud function is also working correctly. With both unit tests and integration tests, the full story of a user adding items to their shopping cart is now complete. Let's say we made some changes to our app. For example, adding a new exciting feature. Let's first make sure our tests still pass locally. On the terminal, under your project directory, type in Firebase Emulators exec npm tests. This emulators exec command is like emulators start, which some of you may remember, but this command also sets the right environment variables so that your code using the admin SDK and rules unit testing SDK will automatically connect to the emulators with the right port numbers. In many cases, this means you can reuse your production code with no changes at all. Okay, let's rock and roll. It's spinning up the Firestore and Functions emulators right now, and now it runs your tests after the emulator suite is ready. And all tests pass. Nice. Finally, you'll notice that the command will automatically shut down the emulators for you. Hey, that's really reassuring to know all tests pass. However, it's really hard for me to remember to run this every time I change something. As my team grows larger, it is also a pain to test everyone's changes together. Here's when continuous integration, or CI, comes into the play. Continuous integration is the process of ensuring your tests run continuously. Whenever you open a pull request, push any new commits, and before you merge, your carefully planned tests need to run automatically. This ensures that you can catch any errors that get introduced as soon as possible. Not when you have a large number of changes that could be the culprit, but on every commit. 
we run CI ourselves here at Firebase, and I'd love to teach you how you can too. You can use any CI framework with the emulator suite, but I'm going to do a deep dive into GitHub Actions today. For those of you who prefer Travis CI or other environments, check out my blog post for the instructions. So let's start. Let's first start by creating a GitHub Actions configuration file so GitHub knows what to do with our repo. You do that by creating a .github folder under the repo root. Then create a subfolder named workflows. That is where we will put the workflow configuration file and let's name it firebase-ci.yaml. If you already have workflow files, feel free to create another file alongside your existing workflow files. All your workflow files will work in parallel. Let's start by telling GitHub when our workflow should run. We can go with a simple on push, which means running the workflow on every push to the repo. We can also run it when pull requests are created. Okay, now let's create a job for this workflow called emulator test and we'll give it a memorizable name. We can then set the environment that it runs on. For a list of options for the environment and other configuration, please check out the GitHub Actions documentation. And now we're ready to create our steps for the job. So here are some basic steps to check out the repository, setting up Node.js, and installing Firebase CRI in the Node.js environment. Now onto our own project setup. We manage our dependencies using npm with this package.json file right here. So we want to install the dependencies using npm install. If you're not using Node.js, feel free to swap the step out with your own command. However, keep in mind that we need to tell GitHub to run npm install within the functions directory instead of the rules directory because that's where we put our tests. You can do that by using the working directory option, specifying the relative paths from the GitHub repository root to the project directory. You might find this useful if your tests are in the functions directory, or if you use the mod repo layout with multiple projects, just like what we have right now. Now, we're ready to run our tests. First of all, don't forget about the working directory option if you're running tests on a subdirectory. Now type in the command Firebase Emulators Exec NPM Test, which we explained a bit earlier. This command starts the emulator suite and then runs the command you specify and then shuts the emulators down. In our case, the command is NPM Test but you can use your own test command if you're not using Node.js. Okay, now we have the configuration, it's time to save and push. You will notice that we are developing this on a branch called Firebase CI, so we can test things out without affecting the main branch and other pull requests that go in. Once we make sure it's working on our branch, then we can safely merge to the main branch. Let's see if our actions are running on GitHub. Go to GitHub, select the Actions tab, and refresh until GitHub kicks off the first action run. There we go! That's our commit message, and you can see the workflow name here. And you can also double check the workflow file config. Yep, that's exactly what we just wrote. We can monitor the progress by clicking on the task here and it shows you the steps running. It's installing the CLI, installing dependencies, and running all the tests. Oh no, the test now fail. What did we do wrong? Let's dig a little bit more into the logs. Oh, it says error, no currently active project. Why does this happen? It's because Firebase CLI doesn't know which project ID it should use on GitHub. So if you're looking into our Firebase JSON, it only describes the services we are using, but it does not contain the project ID. 
The project ID is actually contained in the Firebase RC file, which specifies the default project ID example in our case. This file is usually ignored by the git ignore file, which means it is not uploaded to GitHub and not included on fresh checkup. That's why the Firebase CRI won't be able to know which project you need to run this on. And how do we fix that? Well, simple. We just need to edit the YAML file or more precisely, the final step. Add the dash dash project flag followed by our project ID. You can use any project ID here. It doesn't even have to be real, but keep in mind that this needs to match the project ID you're using in your tests. For example, our tests write Fireshow documents in the project ID example here. And remember earlier, we wrote the test that asserts our cloud function is triggered. In order for the cloud function to actually trigger, you need to specify the same project ID on the command line. Otherwise, some tests may time out or fail due to the functions not running. When in doubt, you can just use your real project ID everywhere to keep it consistent. Don't worry, it won't actually hit production. Now that we fixed the project ID, time to push again. So now if you go to the GitHub Actions page, you will see GitHub already picked up the new commit and it's running the test right now. All right, now you see all tests passed. Great. Yep, it's just like that. So if you push any commits to GitHub, it will run the actions on those commits. You can always see a history of all runs on this actions page as well. In this way, you know which commit broke the test, and then you can fix it with a follow-up commit and make sure everything is working again. Before we wrap up, note that we are only testing on a branch right now. Once you make sure the CI is working, you will definitely want to merge this to your main branch. After that, any pull request to your main branch will also be covered. That's pretty much it. Now you can build your app with much, much better confidence. To recap, here's what we did today. We talked about how we used the emulator suite to make sure our app is working correctly using unit tests and integration tests. We then showed you how you can use GitHub Actions to run continuous integration running these tests as soon as you change something. You can find our example app code, including all tests and GitHub workflow configuration here. I hope you're now ready to write some tests and get them running on CI. If you're watching this and saying to yourself, uh, I'm just getting started on my app. I'm already at a stage of integration testing. Here's a bonus for you. Check out this video on how to use our shiny new emulator UI for iterating our app by my colleagues, David and Tyler. This is something you can use even from day one of app development. You can also use it for manual testing, giving you even more coverage and confidence. But either way, make sure to test often and test before you deploy. Remember, building apps is building user trust, and Firebase is always here to help. Catch you later. Hi, I'm Michael, an engineer on the Firebase team. Getting a public web app set up with Firebase hosting is super simple, but we hear a lot of questions about how to bring a site to production. So today we're going to show you a few steps for getting ready for the big launch and for managing your app once it's out in the wild. My team has been building a site called Friendly Eats. It's a restaurant review app and we're finally about ready to launch it. But before we do, 
I'm going to take a few steps to make sure that my site is ready for real users. So what do we need to do? Something I've already done is create a second dev Firebase project for my app. This way, my team can test out new features without worrying about breaking our production app. I've also already upgraded my production project to the pay-as-you-go Blaze plan. That way I know my site won't get disabled if I exceed the free quota. When I upgraded, I set a budget alert so there won't be any surprises on my monthly bill. Now we're going to change some of our production project settings to get ready for launch. We'll make it easier to see what's happening with cloud logging and better secure our project by tightening permissions. After that, we're going to automate testing and deployment of our site to make development fast and predictable. Let's get started. As you can see, I have two Firebase projects here, a production and a development project. I'm going to go into my production project and go to the hosting panel. From here, I'm going to go to usage and scroll down and see view web request logs with cloud logging. So I want to enable cloud logging so that I can see request logs for everything that my users do on my site. So I'll click here, go ahead and get started, turn it on, and that's all I have to do. So now every time a request hits my production website, I will see a request in cloud logging, which we'll come back to later. Now, I also want to review all of the users that have access to my app. So I'm going to go to settings, users and permissions. And here we have three members of my project, myself and Kay and my teammate Cam. Now Cam is currently listed as an editor, but Cam really only works on the back end. So I'm going to click on Cam, change their role and say that they are a develop admin, but they don't need access to the quality or grow and they don't need to be able to modify permissions or anything like that. So I'll click done, update roles. Now this is just something that is a good practice to do. Before you go live to production, you should review all of the members of your project and make sure that they have appropriate access. Now I'm going to jump over to the Google Cloud Console to restrict the permissions of the browser API key that Firebase uses to call various APIs. I'm going to navigate to APIs and Services and then Credentials. From there, I see that there's a browser key that was automatically created by Firebase. So I'm going to click into that and I'm going to add two types of restrictions. First, I'm going to restrict what types of websites use my API key. Then I'm going to restrict which APIs my key can call. For the websites, I'm going to add my website, which is friendlyeats.reviews, my web.app website that's associated with my Firebase project, and also the URL for my QA preview channel, which I'll be setting up in a little bit. For API restrictions, I'm going to restrict the key to only a set of Firebase APIs. So I want to select the Firebase installations, management, and remote config APIs. And I also want to select the identity toolkit API, which is what Firebase Auth uses. So now that I've restricted both the URLs and the APIs for this API key, I can save that. And now my API key is ready for production. We're getting close to launch day, and I'm feeling pretty confident about my app's security and stability. I've completed most of my production checklist, but one big step remains. I want to automate deployment and testing of my app to make a reliable workflow my whole team can use to bring features from idea to production. To do this, we'll use Firebase hosting preview channels. Channels let me deploy work-in-progress versions of my site to a temporary URL that I can share with my team. I can deploy to channels manually using the Firebase CLI, but we've also added some help to make it easy to integrate channels directly with GitHub. Let's give it a try. I'm going to start by adding my new dev project to my local environment. The Firebase use command lets me swap between projects. You can see that right now I only have a default project, which is prod. I'm going to run Firebase use add and link my dev project as a new environment. This brings up a list of my Firebase projects and I'll go down and select my dev project. I'll also call it dev. This writes configuration to a .firebase RC file in my project directory. You can see I have both default and dev. I'm going to quickly rename default to prod so that I always know which environment I'm dealing with. Once I've done this, I can easily swap between projects. So I can say firebase use dev, 
to switch to my dev project, or I can say Firebase use prod to switch back to my prod project. I can also use a flag to do this on an individual command. So if I want to deploy to dev, I can say Firebase deploy only hosting project dev, and now it will deploy to my dev environment. This makes it easy to use multiple projects with the Firebase CLI. Now that the CLI knows how to work with all of my environments, I need to make sure that my app does too. I've created environment-specific initialization files for my local development and production environments. In this case, I'm just trying to make it easier to see which environment I'm in, but I could do any kind of environment-specific initialization here. To integrate these with my deploy process, I'm going to add a pre-deploy hook to my Firebase.json. This will run a list of commands before every deploy. In this case, installing dependencies and running a build script. A useful feature of the pre-deploy hook is that it provides a gcloud project environment variable for the current project to all scripts that it runs. Switching over to my package.json, I'm going to add a new env script to copy environment-specific initialization based on the gcloud project environment variable, and I'll fall back to local if it's not available. I'll then run the new env script before the build process that happens every time I run my app. Let's take a look at this in practice. I'm starting up my local dev server and will also deploy first to dev, then production environments using a project flag. Once that's done, switching over to my browser, I can see that on localhost, my local initialization script is running. On my dev environment, my dev initialization script is running. And in my prod environment, my prod initialization script is running. Being able to confidently use any of my environments without manually tinkering with settings can really speed up development. To improve the workflow for my whole team, I'm going to further automate deploys using GitHub Actions. The Firebase CLI will help me get this started step-by-step -step with the Firebase init hosting GitHub command. After authenticating with GitHub, the command asks for a repo automatically detecting the origin remote that I'm using. Next, it fetches a service account key from my Firebase project and stores it as a secret in my GitHub repository. Because I've configured a pre-deploy script, I don't need to add an extra build step. The default flow will automatically deploy preview channels for pull requests, but I'll also have it deploy to the live version of my dev site when I merge into my dev branch. Now setup is complete, and I have two new workflows in my .github directory. One will run whenever a new PR is opened or updated in my repo, and will automatically deploy to a preview channel on my dev project. The other will run when a PR is merged and will deploy to the live channel of my dev project. To complete my workflow, I'm going to copy the deploy on merge action into another action, this time to target my production environment. When new code is merged into my main branch, this action will deploy to a QA channel in my production project for final verification before release. And now we have the complete picture. Let's jump ahead to see how this works in action. I have opened the dev version of my app, which looks pretty good, but I've been working on a redesign in preparation for launch in my local environment. There we go. This is definitely going to stand out from the crowd when we launch. Perfect, I think we're all ready to send this out. Switching back to my editor, I'm going to commit my changes in a modern branch and push them up to GitHub. To use the GitHub action I already set up, I'll need to create a pull request. Here's the branch, so I'll go ahead and create one. Creating a pull request will deploy my site to a preview channel without affecting any existing deploys. I'll make my pull request against the dev branch and send it off. Now my pull request is open and I can see a deploy to Firebase hosting on PR action has started running. If I want to, I can click through to watch the deploy progress, but it's all happening automatically. Under the hood, the GitHub action is just running the same Firebase deploy commands I could run locally. Once the action finishes running, it will automatically post a comment with a preview URL back to the pull request. From here, my work on the new feature is done. My teammate Kay is going to take a look and review it before it goes to production. 
Over to you, Kay. Michael shared the URL of his new preview channel with me. Let's pull up this URL to see what he updated and test it out. So I'm on the preview channel now. I see Michael's update and it looks good. Note this preview channel is fully functional. If I submit a review here, then this review will get added to the database in my staging project. Let's look for that review in the Firebase console. Okay, there it is. Since the updates that Michael made look good, I'm ready to merge his PR to our staging branch. Our staging branch is connected to his PR to our staging branching project. When I merge Michael's PR, it automatically deploys to our staging site. So let's merge. And there it is. The updates are now on the staging site. Now, Firebase Hosting gives you the tools you need to set up your own workflow. It's flexible depending on what works for you and your team. We showed you how we've set it up, but remember, you can customize it for your own workflow. To recap our workflow, Michael and I created a website, Friendly Eats. We have a staging environment with a staging project and staging hosting site. And we have a production environment with a production project and production site. When Michael first deployed his changes, he was working in the staging project. His new PR triggered a deploy to a preview channel on the staging site. If he updates that PR, those updates are deployed to that same preview channel. That way, the URL stays consistent. After I looked at Michael's PR, I merged it to our staging branch. We set up our workflow so that when a PR is merged to the staging branch, it's automatically deployed to the staging site. At this point, things are generally looking pretty good, and I'm ready to deploy these changes to our production site. But hold on. My production site is a different environment. It's in a different Firebase project, and it has a different backend than my staging project. Even though my staging project mimics my production project, you never know what might be a little bit different. So we've set up our workflow to include a last sanity check. When I merge my staging branch into my main production branch, this kicks off an automatic deploy to a preview channel for my production site. This preview channel, which we've named QA, allows me to test out the updates with my live production backend. It's a way for the team to see the newest updates that are ready to go out to end users. Once I feel confident that what I see on the QA preview channel is exactly what I want on my live channel, which is my user facing site, I can use the clone command to make sure it's copied over exactly. To do this, I'll run the command clone. I'm cloning from my production site's QA channel to my production site's live channel. The live channel is what my end users see and what my custom domains are linked to. Cloning and done. Both the QA and live channel are now serving the exact same content. Remember, this is just one way to set up your workflow. We provide you with flexible tools such as our preview channels feature and our GitHub action so that you can set up a workflow that works for you. I also have cloud logging as a tool. When Michael set up the cloud logging integration earlier, he set up alerts, but I can check my logs at any time though, by visiting my usage for hosting here. Then I can visit the cloud logging console to filter and search for logs. If my newest update had any issues, I would see it pop up here. For example, I can filter by 404s. We just went over a bunch of features and tools for shipping production web apps with Firebase. Let's recap. Michael and I went through steps to get ready for launching our Friendly Eats site, including setting up different project environments, setting up rules, getting on the Blaze plan, and adding cloud logging. We also went over setting up a GitHub workflow and using preview channels to share updates within our team. Let us know what you think and share how you're using Firebase. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing all of your Firebase hosting apps in production soon. Bye.